Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name, My is, name Carol is Carol Scott. Scott. I am chair of the Board of Regents. Del Mar College, and I'm calling this regular meeting of the Board of Regents to order at 1 p.m. on Tuesday, July 14th. Due to our uh, ongoing health and safety concerns related to the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, this meeting is being conducted by video and or teleconference. Members of the public uh, have been offered an opportunity to provide comment, and we will uh, review that shortly. Uh, but at this point, I'm calling the meeting to order. I'm going to go through a roll call. Uh, as we start, I'm going to ask everyone who is not a regent to please uh, mute your camera, and for all individuals to mute their microphones, uh, unless you are presenting or being called upon to answer a question. Uh, so we have uh, Regent Averett, I see, Reg uh, Dr. Sherwood, Regent Bennett, and Regent Hutchison in attendance. Do we have <laughs> Regent Estrada? Do we have Regent Rivas? Do we have Regent Salinas? We know that Regent Adami is not planning to join us today. Uh, so we do have a quorum uh, of five members and can conduct business today. Uh, if uh, Delia or Natalie on the line would help keep me informed if Regent Salinas, Estrada, or Rivas join the call, please let me know if I don't see them. Uh, going to start with a moment of silence, please. Thank you all very much. Uh, I will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. I will read and I'll, I'll ask you to join me uh, at your places in reading the Del Mar Vision Statement. Del Mar College will be the premier choice for life-changing educational opportunities provided by responsive, innovative faculty and staff who empower students to improve local and global communities. Del Mar College is streaming live audio and video from the official Board of Regents meeting on the college's website in real time with the exception of portions of the meeting that may be considered closed session by statute. At this time, we will have the opportunity for public comment. Dr. Escamilla, were there any public comments offered? It's my understanding, Madam Chair, that there are none. Let me verify. Ms. Williams, uh, Dr. Villarreal, do you know if there are any public comments that were nope. provided? There were none. No, ma'am, there are no pu uh, public comments at this time. Thank you very much. We will proceed with our college president's report. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, bear with me as I'm speaking and trying to breathe with this mask, through the mask. So if there are any audio difficulties, uh, please do not hesitate to um, let me know. Um, that being said, I want everyone, I, I just want to begin by Wishing everyone um, health and safety during these most difficult times. Um, Delmar College continues to adjust and adapt, and adapt our operations, ladies and gentlemen, with the evolving COVID-19 conditions. It's an important kickoff statement for me because this is what we've said we would do since mid-March, and it's what we continue to do, and I think those expectations should continue to uh, be adhered to. As always, our top priority will continue to be health and safety for all who step foot or are part of Del Mar College and beyond. We are currently operating under phase two of our return to campus plan, and the college remains closed to the public with only, only designated areas open on a restricted basis. In light of recent surge in 
positive COVID-19 cases in our community. We have requested employees to work remotely to the greatest extent possible. And we're in the second week of this. We adjusted summer two courses, which began July 6, to be delivered primarily online for the first two weeks of the term. We have also continued to follow strict and health, follow strict health and safety protocols for those very few who are coming on campus, including social distancing measures and the wearing of PP&E or personal protection equipment. A much more detailed picture of the return to campus plan as well as our enrollment numbers will be provided shortly by Lenora Keyes, Executive Vice President, Chief Operating Officer, and Do Tammy McDonald, Vice President of Administration and Human Resources, as they are the co-chairs of our Return to Campus Planning Committee. Last week, on, on, a, on a much lighter note, but still important, and, 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 uh, all, uh, and also approved, uh, excuse me, also in, uh, impacted by COVID-19 or a summer graduation ceremony scheduled for August 14th. This also will be modified into a virtual graduation uh, as we did for the spring semester. So stay tuned for that one and we'll also have more uh, information. What I did get earlier today was that there, there already are already 381 applicants for that summer graduation. And uh, that's a much, much more positive note and uh, but I just wanted to share that. Uh, the ceremony will begin 7 p.m. On, uh, on Friday, August 14th, and be broadcasted on the college's Facebook and YouTube channels. This is a, a difficult, another difficult decision to, to be made, Regents and, and everyone out there, um, but it is one that is highly necessary and I think highly appropriate given uh, the circumstances with which uh, that we're facing. Again, we're gonna take a much deeper dive and open up for uh, questions and conversation, discussion here um, in, our, in our presentation uh, from uh, Vice President Keyes and, and uh, Tammy McDonald. And so um, just know that, uh, you know, it's getting, as things are getting more and more difficult in the community, um, things are evolving here. Uh, we are watching it minute by minute um, it is not an hour-to-hour -hour basis. This is, a, this is a constant. This is an absolute constant. And um, I want you all to know that even the information that we're about to present um, has aged in a, very in a very few short days. And um, as such, we'll be prepared to move and adjust um, um, as appropriate. And I just want to say that uh, um, as the team is getting out there, please bear with us. Nothing is carved in stone. Uh, these presentations were made upwards of 10 days ago. And, uh, and when, we're, when we're living minute to minute um, and, and, and watching numbers hour by hour, 10 days is a very long time ago. So again, know that the presentation that we'll be pres giving and the information we'll be giving to you all uh, remains very fluid and is subject to, to, to what I would say are imminent changes. That is the kickoff of my presentation. Again, the rest of it's gonna fall into the, uh, the other presentations that are coming, Madam Chair and Regents. Um, that is my uh, part of my report today. The rest will fall into the, the, the staff reports. Thank you, Dr. Escamilla. Are there any questions at this time for Dr. Escamilla? I want to call to your attention that Regent Estrada has joined us uh, by conference call, so she is with us as well. Hearing no questions from the board, we will move on to our staff report, starting with the return to campus update. Uh, Dr. Escamilla, your previous comments are your introduction? They are. They, they should serve as my, uh, as my introduction. Thank you very much. Ms. Keyes, Ms. Uh, McDonald, are you prepared to present? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Ms. Keese and I will be presenting our return to campus plan operating under COVID-19 conditions. Next slide. The return to campus plan, the purpose of the uh, planning team and the advisory committee was to assist with ongoing college-wide COVID-19 crisis planning and response efforts. Um, the planning team is comprised of college leadership and it was established in April 
And then the advisory committee was also established to assist the planning team and it's comprised of representatives from administration and the different college councils and we've listed the college councils if you would um, not just the councils but also we have a member from the college-wide safety committee library services and of course planning and institutional effectiveness and we have provided in your packets a list of the membership of the planning team and also the advisory committee so i'm not going to go over it it was provided in your packet to you those uh, individual memberships next slide please The planning team and advisory committee have worked diligently to formulate a plan to return to campus with the health and safety of all accessing campus as our primary focus. And in doing so, the um, team of the, the committee, we established health and safety protocols. And in doing that, we looked at the guidelines that were issued from local, state, and federal, and we used that to establish and implement the protocols. For example, we had orders from the governor, Governor Abbott. We also had orders from New Aces County Judge Canales, the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, and they provided clarification as to how to integrate processes, specifically with the coordinating board. They um, had some very defined processes that were specific to higher ed. So we, we had to make sure that we followed those and we actually had to submit something to the coordinating board um, about oh. our plan that's been part of our process. We also referenced the Center for Disease Control guidelines. We also had input from local medical specialists in developing those protocols. We developed processes for all campus locations or programs to meet student, faculty, and staff considerations. And we'll go into, into detail when we get to some of the uh, phase plan documents about some things that were implemented in processes. So we will get into some of that detail in just a little while. Next slide. Our health and safety protocols, this began in May and when we started phase one, like I said, we'll, we'll discuss in a little bit more detail what the phases are, but our health and safety protocols began with individual health assessments and that, were, that was for students and employees and guests that were invited on campus were required to submit those if they wanted to access campus. Um, that was primarily used to identify if anyone had symptoms, if anyone had close contact with uh, someone who had been diagnosed as positive. So we wanted to gather that information and make sure people were clear to come to campus. We implemented social distancing processes six feet or more apart in many ways in different activities and functions across the campus. We, from day one, when we opened back up um, for instruction and for more access to campus, we required face coverings. Um, ex unless you were in a private office alone. So then, then you could take off your face cover, but otherwise it's required everywhere on campus. Um, we have sanitation stations and disinfect uh, disinfection was applied. And you know, we have, I think you, you probably haven't seen it, but you know, we have the stations we can go up and get the hand sanitizer. Um, different departments and functions were provided with all types of disinfectant um, supplies so that they could use those if they're in their offices or for instruction. We also had some decon or decontamination equipment that um, the safety office purchased so that we can decontaminate rooms like with a fogger. So those were also um, used in this process. And then we restricted access to campus. As Dr. Escamilla talked about earlier, we are closed to the public and we have restricted access for um, employees and for students. So there are only certain categories that you should be on campus. And then we place signage throughout uh, the campus and signage could be maybe one door is an entrance and one's an exit so that we don't have congestion with people getting too close trying to get in and out the same door. It could be the reminders to stay six feet apart, the social distancing. It could be the reminders about wash your hands, use hand sanitizer. Um, it could also be the symptoms for COVID, reminding people if, if this is going on with you, please stay home. So all different types of reminders um, have been and signage have been placed through campus. After the return to campus, um, we also implemented a process to report. So once people did start coming back into campus um, in May, we did have a reporting process that was put in place as part of our protocol. So that if you were cleared to come to campus, but let's say a week later, you started having symptoms, then there was a reporting process to go back and fill out your individual health assessment. If you had symptoms, contact with the positive, or if you were diagnosed positive, so that you can receive further instructions on um, 
you know, if you had to isolate or quarantine, or also to let the college know, was there some type of exposure on campus? So that was also implemented as part of our protocols. Next slide. This is a return to campus planning document. It was developed, um, it includes a framework of guiding principles and protocols per established phases. So like I said, we're not gonna read every single thing on this, but go and give some highlights. And some of those highlights is, and it, it will show on every page of the document, is um, our objectives. So we have four objectives, and they are to protect the health and safety of the Del Mar College campus community, provide a coordinated transition to resume on-campus instruction, student support, and administrative services, open campus facilities to the public, including appropriate resumption of additional on-campus activities, and monitor current conditions and respond as necessary, allowing for flexibility to increase or decrease levels of restriction. When we began phase one, like I said, you know, Dr. Escamilla talked earlier about that we are in phase two. But for phase one, you know, our primary focus was completing the spring students. You know, that was that was the primary focus and to begin summer one. We had a lot of spring students that um, because of the courses they were enrolled in, they required a lot of the hands-on skills training and they, they could no longer complete their courses just virtually or online. So that was our primary focus for phase one was to get those students for spring back, back in to complete their courses. Also that many of them was to allow them to graduate. And uh, many of those were in the career technology and that was part of the uh, governor's order that did allow that to take place um, in May was career technology. So of course it included all of our health healthcare, our health related programs um, the industrial programs, the welding, public safety, EMS, police, fire, those were included in those programs. And of course they required the hands-on skills training. Okay. So in phase one, we had very restricted access. We had uh, restricted protocols. Like I said, from that day one, we required um, face coverings. Um, and then as you move into phase two, which we're currently in right now, it gives you a timeline in phase two started no earlier than July the 6th to complete summer. And this is the phase we anticipate to be in for the fall. But as Dr. Escamilla mentioned, um, it's changes. It could change not just daily, but hourly. So it's a very fluid situation at all times. And we're very much aware of that. Um, we actually implemented uh, what we're calling to the to the far right, the transition stage. We implemented that when summer two, July 6th. So we held off on starting some of the hands-on on-site um, skills classes. We kept them off campus and, and doing remote learning and virtually uh, for the first week and many for the second week because of the current conditions here, here in the county with the spike in cases. So we did use that, that particular um, phase. So it, again, it goes over the focuses in each phase and the conditions in which we are operating under. Next slide. So with this part of the, of the phases, we wanted to make sure that if, if someone was looking for something uh, in particular, you say, okay, I'm an employee, so what applies to me? Or I'm a student. So it's broken out that, and College Relations did a wonderful job on putting this document together and communicating it well. So I want to give them the credit. They did a great job. Um, so on the employee phase, in a, in it, um, based on what are our current conditions and what are the needs of the college. So. As Dr. Eskimi said, we we planned on um, for July 6 to to bring back more of the um, to more students and that needed the skills training or also some more employees to provide support services. But because of the certain conditions we're under and the spike in our positives in the community, we held off on that. We're kind of back into phase one as far as the amount of employees are coming to campus. They're, they're back working remotely if they are all possible and only the most essential are on campus right now. Um, and like we said, same thing with, with students. Um, they Last week, we pretty much held off all the uh, courses to, to stay remote. Some started back this week and some will start back next week on campus. And then phase three, we anticipate for the spring, but like we said, this is a very fluid situation. And then we'd like to so say, we always have that transition phase, which I call it kind of the pivot phase, that if any conditions change, 
we move into transition and we may have to redo and rework and rethink our phases um, at every every step of the way. For the employees, what we what we provided for the employees is we give them information about if they're coming to campus or not, or if they can continue to work remotely. Um, it depends on what setting or what their supervisor has asked or the needs of the college and what conditions that we're under. So if you are um, essential, you could be on campus. But some things that we have provided um, would also allow the employees to continue to work remotely. So we are very cognitive of that. And if it can be continued remotely, then we are you know, allowing those situations to remain remote. In the student phase, we also give them the same information. You have to be a student that's what you've been told that your course is going to be on campus. You can't just show up. Um, it has to be a course that we're saying, yes, you could come and do your, your uh, course work or your skills training on campus. We also give them very specific information, just like the employees. If you have symptoms, if you've had close contact with a positive, don't come to campus. Um, they're instructed you know, to fill out the form to see if they can be cleared under certain conditions. So it's very specific information for employees and for students, depending on what phase that we're in. And then, of course, like I said, if it changes, we go back into that pivot or that transition phase and provide updated and, and new information for employees and for students. Next slide, please. So what we have provided is uh, some information here uh, talking about personal protective equipment, or you may hear people refer to it as PPE. So we, you know, we have um, on PPE, we have the face coverings which we have, um, you can wear a mask, you can wear a bandana. So in some of our documentation and protocols, we've provided that information on the different types of face coverings that, that you could wear, also the appropriate use and care that also is in some of our, our protocol documents. And while we also added face shields to the PPE that could be something that's acceptable to, to wear on campus. Um, we provide all the different hand sanitizers and disinfectant um, type of supplies. Also keyboard covers and um, wipes to wipe down things to, to make sure things are sanitized after every use if, if, if multiple people are having to use the same keyboard. We've also installed, I think if you can probably see in a picture of the boardroom, plexiglass in different places to where it could help block some of that um, access or, or proximity to, to people. We've also installed that in some of our service areas, like I know the cashier's office you know, was, was open area, so plexiglass was installed. Um, so that's various places throughout campus, not just in employees areas, but also if it could have been installed in classrooms, you know, was it necessary to install something in classrooms? So we have been very diligent on PPE, and if someone comes to campus and they need access and they do not have a face covering, we are supplying the face covering for them. Okay. Next slide. Hello, uh, this is Lenora Keys, and I'll start over from here. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, we continue on with the phases, and we look here more at the employee and the work area. Continuing a lot of this information is very similar as we phased from uh, transition from phase one into phase two, and it continues to reiterate the uh, social distancing and the safety requirements. And uh, however. It does address meetings, and we'd start all meetings with a health and safety reminders. And we're going to update the signage as appropriate because if we were to change anything, we would be available to make those changes. And we use exits and entrances as marked. So if you're an employee, you could look at this particular page and know how it impacted your area. Departments will continue planning and begin implementing on-site transition with staggered start times, rotated schedule, and continue to remo work remotely. So it's continuing to make all those modifications as uh, these conditions within the, com the community evolve. And when you look at phase three and then the transition phase, it's very similar as to the previous phases. However, an employee could look specifically at this page and know the framework and the structure by which they are to operate. Next slide, please. In this uh, page is looking for your student and instructional requirements. 
and continuing, we're still in phase two, and I would like to highlight that online instruction continues for the majority of students with hybrid and face-to-face -face instruction provided on a limited basis. And that is what we're operating under right now for summer two and how we propose or foresee fall semester beginning. Uh, we, we're, what we're saying is everything that we're doing in the summer becomes the model for the fall. As we've learned these protocols and implemented them, and this becomes the modeling that would hopefully continue into the fall. Campus is open to expanded group of enrolled students with restricted, limited access for instruction and testing. And testing would be TSI testing or any of that type of testing or testing for online classes that would be necessary. Online student services continue with limited expansion of on-site student services. And faculty and instructors are to monitor daily their social distancing, attendance, usage of face coverings and hand sanitizer supply. Um, I wanted to mention attendance because to take attendance on a daily basis is required and very necessary. For instance, if you did have a student who were to call in and say, I'm not feeling well, I'm being tested, you need to know everyone that they've come into contact for the tracing that's taken place. So this was another area that we had to reinforce and it's being reinforced across the uh, Physical facilities. The department is to clean classrooms based on utilization and we've asked the instructors and students to sanitize the workspaces after each use. So that would, someone would write down their own computer after to uh, be given the sanitized wipes and write down their own computer would be an example of that. If we, as we get to move into phase three, we've put on here no earlier than spring 2021 semester or subject to revision based on evolving conditions. And I think that's throughout everything we've said, it's always based upon evolving conditions. And that phase three would be really moving back into more of an open campus. And uh, instead of continuing with the restricted campus, we are continuing and foresee that fall would be under the restricted campus. And phase, uh, transition phase is the same as previous uh, slides. However, it's always there to transition back and forth as needed and as we monitor what's going on in the community. Next slide, please. And this has to do with the faculty requirements. So a faculty member could look at this phase and see what would be different from previous slides. And I'd like to point out that uh, where it says community and public events and student recreational events will be considered on a pre-scheduled, pre-approved basis with restricted and limited access. And we have had uh, uh, very good friends and uh, friends to the college, I should say, and involved within different programs asked to come on campus this summer. And they basically have not been able to accommodate that under safety requirements. However, we realize with the fall, there are many activities that normally happen on campus. And so they could be considered under this uh, requirements, but it would also depend upon where we were as a community and what we were dealing with. We do have limited services to the following areas, which would be dining. As you know, under the governor's order right now, all food must be in individual containers and things like that. Right now we are operating solely with uh, vending machines to keep everything safe. So that could change or open up or restrict. The child care center has not come back uh, into full utilization and that is being monitored and we do have a timeline. We do not know exactly how that will work out because we continue to monitor it depending upon what's going on in the community. Uh, campus libraries will open with limited capacity and access to select spaces and services. They've been operating as a testing center on the first floor this last summer. However, those services throughout the library are being monitored and being considered now. To open the entire library would be very difficult to maintain the safety and so we're looking at that. And so we're always maintaining uh, and looking at the at, uh, requirements and structure to make sure that everything's in place. And site assessment continues, uh, assessments to classroom layout, lab layout uh, to remain in compliance with most recent state health and safety guidelines. Your cleaning schedules are based upon utilization patterns and priority areas. And your common high touch equipment is cleaned by the departments each every time after every use. 
as you can see, and everything else is very similar. However, it does address the facilities. One thing that we've been focusing on is that every classroom that would be utilized in the summer or the fall has been uh, reviewed. Uh, all the inventory has been done on our facilities to determine the capacity of classrooms with social distancing in place. And so all those types of requirements have been monitored and are being reviewed continuously as different classes and different labs are being uh, considered or on the schedule. And I'll go to the next slide, please. This is the, the one page that really that addresses all of the health and safety protocols. Starting uh, when we first came back in May and March, and then reviewed again uh, very closely when we uh, came, our first uh, students were allowed back on campus May the 17th, and this bit went into effect right away. Uh, with social distancing in place, and it identifies uh, what that means, and what we consider to be uh, facial coverings, and what would be included in the practice of hygiene, and how we would uh, address limited gatherings and meetings, and so that people don't gather up. And so all of this has been in place since the beginning, uh, once we allowed anyone back on campus. And I'd like to uh, continue to say that we were, you know, we implemented that uh, face, facial coverings were required. We never had them just restricted. They've always been required. And uh, our protocols have been very uh, conservative, I would consider, and, and very uh, practical and, and provided a very strong framework. And your idea is down there where it has to stay at home when you are sick. That again is the self-check that we've asked everyone to continue. And if there are some revisions that have been come out from the governor's office just recently, and those re revisions are included. I'd like to say it again that this entire framework and document was prepared by College Relations. They've done an excellent job of helping us to focus through the different processes and procedures that that needed to come into practice and recognizing all of the different guidelines and the generally the different areas of the college and the different uh, communities within the college from students to faculty, staff, employees, everyone that needed to be considered. This framework really, and Lorette Williams has done a great, great job in providing us this framework by which we can function and move forward. So thank you, I wanted to give them recognition for all the work that went into this document. So, uh, in, any questions, I guess, at this point over this document before I move on? So, Regents, I'm going to uh, welcome Regent Salinas. He was able to join us a few minutes ago, so he's been on the line for a little bit. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, Regent Averett, do you have any questions? Nope. Okay, thank you. Dr. Sherwood? Nope. Regent Bennett? No. Thank you. Regent Hutchison. Regent Estrada, I think you're on the line via telephone. Do you have any questions or comments? Okay. We're not hearing from you, so I'm assuming you do not. Regent Salinas, do you have any questions or comments? Regent Salinas? Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Keys. We can move on. Okay. Thank you, uh, Regent Scott. Uh, next slide, please. This next part of our presentation is a bit of a summary as to how those phases were put into practice. Uh, in beginning the spring semester, as we mentioned, we were, Dr. Escamilla mentioned, we, the focus of the spring semester, we, of course, everyone complied with the stay at home order, which went into effect the second week after spring break, really. Uh, but however, we returned March the 16th from spring break and extended uh, that spring break one week for every classes except for those that were already online. The classes that were online were allowed to continue that week everyone else who were asked to begin to transition to online to finish out that semester as much as possible. However, within the governor's, I believe, second order, he did allow for uh, continuing uh, uh, for career technology courses, which is 
primarily our workforce courses, predominantly on West Campus, your industrial type uh, public safety courses, to come back to campus later for face-to-face -to, -face to finish. And we were able to do that. Basically, uh, completing the semester with over 819 students receiving their credentials and degrees. And so we were very proud of the fact that that took a great effort college-wide uh, between the registrar's office, uh, IT to provide students with um, computers and, and provide staff with computers so that all of the support pieces could continue and the students could be served and finish out those classes. And uh, so spring one, spring semester continued under phase one with complete restricted access through, the end, through May. And uh, we were very successful in completing the spring semester. Next slide, please. We began to plan immediately in March, April, as to how we could handle summer and uh, fall semesters. And we reviewed almost every process that we have in the college and recognized that the students, uh, in the short term at least, were coming online. Our May semester, which is about a 10-day semester that happens at the end of May, we were able to increase the number of courses and offer that semester. It's a very short semester but to offer it totally online and we were increased enrollment and that proved to be a very good, uh, a very successful store, uh, semester and also indicated the need or the demand from students for classes. And that helped us in planning for semesters uh, summer one and two. In summer one semester, of course, was phase one under restricted access to campus we were mainly online with very limited face-to-face -face for only those career technology courses that fell under the governor's order. And those courses and students were primarily on West Campus. Uh, we actively engaged this return to campus transition phases in this plan that we just went over. It was actively engaged and implemented as the framework, framework in which we operated. We were able to uh, have a student headcount for summer one of over 4,000 students with a 3.6% increase from 2019. And to service that many students, I really have to congratulate our faculty and staff and the efforts that took place there. It was predominantly online and, uh, and then also on West Campus where they diligently implemented the uh, protocols and followed them in, uh, for this summer one semester. This was also a 6.4% increase in contact hours, which is the funding, the basis on which we are funded. And of course, we are in a base year. So those were important to us. And those numbers are preliminary and that they're not certified quite yet by the coordinating board. Uh, next slide, please. We are presently in the second semester of summer and we are still under, we are now under phase two, which continues restricted access to campus. We are still actively engaged in our health and safety protocols, and we are requiring most courses to be online, and predominantly they are required for the first two weeks. Most of the courses, almost two thirds, are already online throughout the entire semester. However, uh, we are offering many for hybrid with limited face-to-face, -face, again, for the career technology courses. And there are a few general academic courses that will begin uh, next week, I believe, uh, on East Campus. I'm going to revise the student headcount and contact hours that were printed here. This was as of early in the week last week, and then as of Friday morning, we received updated numbers because remember that uh, summer Summer two just began July the 6th, and so there was another drop date in there. And so I did want to share with you the updated numbers for summer two. The student headcount for summer two uh, actually increased by 3%, not 5%. However, the contact hours increased by 17%, not 22%. So you can see the drop uh, after just a few days once they run the final numbers. Uh, so, but I did want to give you the most current numbers. This, these were these were accurate when we posted. However, that was that much of a change within that the week. Yes, and then as we begin to look at fall semester, we will continue under phase two with restricted access to campus. 
we are implementing online hybrid and face-to-face -face classes, but we're enhancing the hybrid within the teleconferencing courses. The teleconferencing is where we're going into the classrooms, the faculty are, and they're videotaping themselves, uh, videotaping labs, wherever possible to prepare for enhanced online classes or to make as much possible learning that could be done remotely as possible. And to so that it's not uh, the traditional online class if we're required to remember the transition phase, if even the face-to-face -face classes were required to transition back to online, there would be more enhanced content already pre-taped, more personalized to that specific course. We're in the process of ordering more cameras and more supporting technology for that type of uh, classwork. And we're constantly monitoring changes within the COVID-19 conditions in the community so that that could be implemented. Ms. Keys, we're deaf Ms. Keys yes. um, I wanted to ask a quick question, and then I think we had a region who had their mic open. On student headcount, that is a unduplicated headcount, correct? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay, That's I just wanted to make sure that, that I understood that, that definition. And Ms. Estrada had her microphone on for just a second. I don't know if she has a question or not. Okay, hearing none, we'll, we, I'll let you do your last slide, then we'll see if there's a wrap up for any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Regent Scott. Um, we're continuing to prepare for fall semester. And of course, the conditions that have occurred here in the county for the last two weeks has made planning uh, more difficult, I will say, in that we are continuing to look at all different aspects and all different options as far as delivering instruction and how it best meets the needs of the students and the needs of the type of instruction that is taking place. However, we're moving forward within our structure and our framework. We believe we are ready to uh, accommodate whatever situation comes up. And so we're very prepared for the fall semester. Next slide, please. In addition to our planning, uh, other committees are working with uh, re COVID related uh, issues that are coming up. One is the CARES Act, and that is a funding uh, that is available and has already gone out to our students. This totaled $3.8 million in total that has been made available, with $1.9 million to be directed towards students, would go directly to students, and another $1.9 million of the 3.8 is available to the college to augment additional expenses in the delivery of instruction. That uh, as, is another committee that's working diligently on that with faculty and staff across the campus. And then there's the FEMA grant and the Family First Act that are also uh, impacting our, our availability and provide resources. And that's the end of our presentation. If you have any questions, we're, Tammy and I are both available. Are there questions? Regents, if you would unmute your mic, I'll, that way I'll know if you have a question or not. I don't see any. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. McDonald, Ms. Keys, for that presentation. Um, and we will now move on to the discussion of our risk management uh, funds. And Dr. Escamilla, do you, would you like to open up that discussion? I really, I really would. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. The risk management management reserves fund has been a topic at, uh, as another um, result of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, crisis that we're facing. This is part of the uh, promise to come back to you all with more specific information for the concept. Uh, again, it's a staff report and we're looking for uh, continued feedback. Um, we're using this, um, we're, we're proposing this mechanism to be folded into the fiscal 21 uh, budget and it is a, a, we believe, a necessary tool uh, to prepare for not only the impacts of, of the current uh, pandemic crisis but the impending uh, results um, that our economy will be facing and the what we believe to be the uh, imminent um, um, reduction in in state appropriations and possibly other areas in the uh, next uh, the next biennium 
So that being said, Mr. Garcia and team, um, please um, kick us off on this uh, presentation. Yes, thank you for that introduction, Mr. President. Um, Madam Chair, Mr. President, and members of the board, good afternoon. Uh, let's begin with the college staff report on the uh, risk reserve fund. Delmar College is in the midst of a two-pronged crisis. First, there's the health and safety of our students and employees due to the COVID-19 crisis. Second is the recession and the related financial implications that may continue through the end of fiscal year 2025. The college vision is to establish a five to seven million dollar risk reserve fund that is sufficient and flexible enough to support the mission of the college throughout the crises. The fund will also provide the financial flexibility to maintain steady and modest tuition increase and to minimize the student shock that was experienced following the 2008 recession. Tuition and fees increased by $154 for eight semester hours from fiscal year 2011 to 2012 in response to state appropriation reductions of 3.3 million, a total of 3.3 million from fiscal year 2010 to fiscal year 2013. This action also satisfies the credit agency's ex expectations for financial flexibility this last point is, is based on an article issued by Fitch Bond Rating Agency titled, U.S. State and Local Ratings Through the Cycle During an Economic Downturn. The article provides insert, insights on Fitch's bond rating criteria, one of which is the expectation that the issuers such as Del Mar College will build up and maintain or maintain financial flexibility in an economic recovery uh, that will be utilized during an inevitable downturns. After reading this article, it gave me great comfort to think that our narrative about the risk reserve fund would be well received by the three major bond rating agencies. A few weeks later, the college received high AA bond ratings from the three uh, bond rating agencies. I think this may be in part because of our narrative on the risk reserve before I transition into the financial risks on the next slide, uh, does anybody have any questions? Okay, moving right along. Next slide, please. So I came across this quote that encapsulates the purpose of the risk fund. It is from a speech given by Ben Bernanke addressing the Federal Reserve titling lessons learned from the 2008 financial crisis. He said, and I'm going to paraphrase, uh, paraphrase a bit, organizations must understand their liquidity needs to prepare for the possibility that liquidity may erode quickly and unexpectedly. The college has completed a financial re resource risk assessment that could potentially erode the college's liquidity levels during uh, the duration or following the crises. On this slide uh, are a few examples. State appropriations funding may be reduced by 3.3 million or 10% in fiscal years 2022 or 2023, uh, similar to what we experienced uh, Im immediately after the 2008 crisis. There's also the possibility that the cost of health and safety supplies and equipment may exceed the planned budget uh, uh, for the estimates uh, in fiscal year 2021 and 2022. There's also the possibility that current FEMA support will run low if the crisis is prolonged. Our best guess estimate for annual expenses is about 1.5 million per year based on current spending trends. There's also the possibility that property tax collections may, may decline. Our best guess estimate is approximately 800,000 per year if the unemployment rates continues or escalates. Then there's the possibility of a hurricane. Note the college did not experience, I'm sorry, the college experienced minimal expenses from the Hurricane Harvey in part because of FEMA's financial support. But just imagine if I get hit with two crises, in addition to what we have today, the hurricane, will FEMA have the financial capacity to help us through two crises is the big question mark. 
just food for thought. The college has already taken measures to scale back spending in the current year in an effort to achieve the five to seven million dollar surplus that will be transferred to the risk uh, reserve account at the end of the fiscal year. Are there any questions on this slide? Okay. I'm gonna move on to the next slide, please. As previously mentioned, one of the goals is to have financial resources that are sufficient and flexible enough to support the mission of the college throughout the crises. Transfers from the risk reserve fund account to the operating fund account will be made on an annual basis for financial risks related to activities like the ones previously described. In addition, the financial statement to the board will be redesigned to report the risk reserve fund account balance for transparency. The funds will be transferred back to the operating fund account balance once the COVID-19 and the recession is behind us. However, there's also the possibility of extending the reserve fund based on an updated risk assessment to determine if financial resource risk continue to exist. Are there any questions? Wonderful. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes my presentation. Uh, on the risk reserve fund. One, so, more, com one more comment, Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Yes, Dr. Dr. Escamilla. Sir, sure, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and Regents, again, we placed this item uh, on the staff report um, listing prior, right before this next presentation. So these two are, are tied together. Um, the risk management uh, fund uh, we wanted to give you some descriptors and things, some concepts and so forth, and then again, we're going to tie it into the next, into the next uh, presentation. So um, just know that, and, and again, this has all been part of the financial stabilization plan that began in earnest back in really April, and um, um, we believe that this is a uh, um, a, a solid uh, tool tool in the in, in the uh, in our chest, if you will, uh, to prepare for uh, the, the next 24 months. Um, the numbers over here are all um, uh, possible scenarios um, with with uh, with the various plugins that uh, Mr. Garcia provided for us, and and uh, uh, in terms of uh, our outlook and the possibilities. And the number five to seven million. Um, you know, it, again, it's a placeholder. I think five million is is definitely the floor, and um, it, it could be it could be more than that as soon as uh, the closeout of this year. Uh, we may see a little bit more. I don't know how much more, uh, but um, um, we just want you to know the nature of those numbers. They they too are fluid. Uh, I'll answer any questions you may have. So I have a couple of questions, and then I'll, I'll ask the regents to unmute if they, if they have some follow-up or additional questions. Uh, so are you looking at this as a uh, fund that the board would have policy uh, oversight on? Tell me how it fits into our existing policy structure on reserve funds. So this one, this particular fund, we're looking to have um, – the most flexibility with it as possible. Uh, things change very quickly, as you know, and that's, that's the uh, responsive nature of this fund as we were putting it together. That's been the, the basic idea. And um, similar to the plant fund, though, before any dollars would be expended f from, these, um, from this particular fund, um, we, would, we would certainly bring it to the board um, as a notification and discussion uh, prior to. The whole idea uh, really came from, from being uh, as flexible as we could. You know, our options were put it in the, into, the, into, the, um, into the reserves fund, which has greater restrictions, and or put it into the plant fund, which has lesser restrictions, but it's for sp more specific types of things. This one is a broader, more functional tool uh, that we're asking for uh, your support on and consideration to uh, to keep that flexibility in place. We're not going to go into it unless we come to the regents anyway for for feedback. Um, but again, we wanted uh, as and, and I believe the college needs as as um, 
relatively little uh, restriction on this one as possible. So this would be established as part of the upcoming budget uh, based out of, again, unexpended funds in the current fiscal year 20 budget? Well, it, 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 it's the way it's, it's um, I don't want to start practicing accounting, uh, Mr. Garcia, where it's actually placed isn't, I asked that very same question, or it was asked uh, very similarly in another meeting that we had, but I, I think technically it's not in the budget per se. Mr. Garcia, can you uh, help clarify that, where those dollars would actually um, I get, no, it's, it's not. It's not whether or not it's in the budget. Is when is the fund actually established? When are, are you oh, asking sure. for yes. board action at a future board meeting to establish the fund? Yeah. So we're. It, it's part of the scenario for the completion and the proposal of this fiscal 21 budget. It's a tool, much like the plant fund, and and, and basically it, it'll actually technically be s sitting right next to the plant fund in terms of operational uses. So okay. if you can see it that way. Uh, so it's it's a it's a um, we're we're we are seeking your input. We are looking for um, pros and cons from y'all's position, and what you do and don't um, like about the whole thing, mm -hmm. and so that we can formulate to the next uh, couple of board meetings and ultimately approve this as part of our general uh, uh, budgetary. Um, well, budget for the for the fiscal 21 uh, again not technically part of the budget but part of the overall plan so what I would like to see is an actual policy document that again provides the flexibility and I certainly understand the yes. management flexibility that you need yes ma'am but also would then provide the board the policy oversight uh, that is appropriate so as opposed to a verbal let's have a policy document that outlines the establishment, yes. use, reporting, and oversight function uh, that the board would have, yes. uh, again, uh, maximizing your management flexibility. I don't have a pr I think it's a great sure. idea. Sure. Uh, I think it's, it's very, very smart to think about this in terms of a longer term period over the next three to five years and potentially for other kinds of risk uh, situations or crisis situations, but I think the board needs to see a policy document that again establishes uh, both the, the fund and the oversight that the board would have and then let us respond to that policy document. Yes ma'am, we can have that for you at the next meeting. In fact, I think uh, we've already have lots of uh, uh, notes uh, in that regard. And um, Raul, Mr. Mr. Garcia and team, did you hear um, Regent uh, uh, Chair Scott's uh, response there? Absolutely. So more to come in our next board meeting. Um, hopefully we'll have a first draft of the policy for some feedback. I, I think it's what I'm hearing. That's yes, it. sir. This is Tammy. I heard. Okay. Okay. With that, are there other uh, board members who have questions or comments? Unmute your mic if you do, please. Okay. Uh, I don't see uh, Regent Estrada on, and so I'm going to just call on her specifically if she has any uh, questions or comments. Okay, I don't hear from her. So again, thank you very much for that. I think that's a, a, the board is concurring with you by, by their silence. There is concurrence. Uh, but we look forward to that policy document coming back in August. Thank you for the feedback. Very valuable feedback, Madam Chair and uh, Regents. All right, so uh, we're now moving on to our budget update for the year. Uh, do you have any introductory comments there, Dr. Escamilla? I, I think I've already kind of uh, segued uh, into this next report. Thank you, Madam okay. Chair. Mr. Garcia. Yes, yeah, so thank you for the introduction. Um, let's begin the college staff report on the budget. The college is adding the final pieces to the 2021 budget plan based on the best available information. The difference with this year's budget plan is that we are planning around a two-pronged crisis, which includes the COVID-19 and the recession. In addition, there continues to be uncertainty on how long the crises will last and the possibility of another catastrophic loss in the near future. As mentioned in the previous staff report, the risk reserve fund will provide the college with the financial stability during this period of uncertainty. So let's get started with the plan resource allocation to the strategic driven operating activities. Dr. West will lead us into this discussion. Next, uh, next slide, please. 
Okay, and then it'll be the next slide. Yes, I'm sorry. The next slide. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. As you all know, the budget team has been working in the past years to improve the budget process. And one of those things that we've been working really hard on is to be sure that our resource all allocation processes support the strategic plan goals of the college. Last year in the FY 2020 budget, we worked with Dr. Christina Wilson's team to tie the new budget request to the strate strategic plan initiatives. And as you remember, in those last year presentations, it was the first time that we actually had slides that showed the, uh, the goals and then the new budget request tied to those goals. And we have continued that process for the 2021 budget. However, since this year's budget uh, remains level in a lot of areas, uh, the new budget requests are minimal. But what I've done here in this slide is show what we allocated last year uh, during the 2020 budget process to show that those funds were allocated last year and still remain to support our strategic plan goal. So starting out with goal one, as you can see on completion, Last year, we allocated new resources of 172,000, and that was to provide optimal support for student completion and transfer, support our dual credit students to complete coursework, and then require comprehensive advising training for our faculty and staff who advise. And then on goal two for recruitment and persistence, again, we had uh, some new funds allocated there in 2020 and that was to provide strategic communication plans to promote services available to students and support continuous enrollment unit achievement of educational goals then moving over to the right is goal four our learning environment and last year we set up the one million dollars to start putting money out there for the south campus operations and um, startup costs and then for 2021, we have allocated approximately 1.9 million, and that is the employee uh, compensation or, or raises to retain professional faculty and staff. We have some feedback. Someone, Could it someone? It's echoing. Okay. And then we have this year we have, you'll see in the later slides, we have an increase to our insurance premiums and we also have an increase to our cost of electricity. And then all the way over to the right, goal five, workforce development, community partnership and advocacy. Last year we allocated 368,000 to corporate services training contracts with business and industry. And then in 2021 is a board year election. So we've found 160,000 to fund the board election. And then next slide. Okay, this one, this is still going on with our, uh, linking our, our funds to our strategic plan. In this case, this is our plant reserve funds and we have uh, for goal three academic preparedness and student learning we have set up 4.2 million for our erp campus management system and then to support goal four our learning environment we have currently have allocated out of the plant fund 9.85 million for the south side campus furniture and fixtures And I think, Raul, you pick it up from here, right? Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. West. Appreciate it. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, our last item for this part of the presentation is the Risk Reserve Fund, which is linked to our goal for financial effectiveness and affordability. Once again, the purpose of the Risk Reserve Fund uh, with an estimated value of 5 to $7 million will provide a certain level of assurance that the LMR will continue to support the mission of the college throughout the COVID-19 and the recession. 
The funds will be used towards unplanned costs associated with unforeseeable business interruptions, such as the ones listed uh, in the previous, on this slide, I'm sorry, uh, that may occur at any point in time uh, within the next five years. The reserve fund will also provide the financial flexibility to maintain steady and modest tuition increases and to minimize the student check that was experienced in, la in, the, in our last recession. For example, tuition and fees increased by $154 for an eight semester hour from fiscal year 2011 to 2012. This increase was in response to total state appropriation reductions of 3.3 million from fiscal year 2010 to fiscal year 2013. Before I transition to the next slide, are there any questions? I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, the plant reserve funds, it looks like we've allocated about $14 million of that. Yes, sir. Uh, how's that correlated to the investments, which we'll, we'll see later in the, in the agenda? It, it shows about $13.5 million in the plant reserve fund. Is there something I'm missing? So uh, I, I, I think uh, I'm going to ask Kathy, Dr. West to chime in, but you know, we, we've been very, Kathy has done a phenomenal job in working with Linda Patterson and getting some pretty good yields on our investments. Um, uh, okay. Kathy, can you talk about that a little bit more? I can clear that up. The, what I showed on that previous slide was the total of what we plan on spending on the uh, ERP, but we've actually expended part of that. So that's why the what you're seeing on the investment report is slightly less. That, that oh, clears it up. Yes. Uh, yes. Another question I have for Mr. Garcia, uh, don't we want to keep a balance in that plant reserve fund? Uh, you know, uh, I think in prior discussions with the board, we, committed to funding certain activities and so we're sticking to that plan uh, now uh, I'm, I'm listening to what what you're you're telling me uh, what would be the objective so then? Mr. mr garcia let me let, let me let me jump in there uh, mr bennett i think i can be more to the point on that because this this topic is is coming up as a result of what we're seeing here i think the an the short answer would be yes you know, we'd like to keep a, a stronger, healthier um, number, um, unallocated number in the plant fund. However, and, and frankly, much of this uh, risk reserve fund that we are putting together now uh, as a result of, uh, of the, the crises that we're facing would have gone into that plant fund. So in effect, uh, what we're doing, at least in the interim, uh, or as until we get through these crises, uh, are putting it into a different bucket, if you will, and I want to talk about these these uh, the uses here after this. But uh, the idea is that uh, ideally we would have more, and maybe we will um, uh, realize more of those dollars in there. Uh, I was alluding to that earlier that if there, in, in, in case there are more dollars than the five to seven million uh, that that we're looking at, we may at the end of this year or even at the end of next year. We may be able to um, uh, move some of those dollars over into the plant fund. I'm right with you, and I, I, I want there to be a healthier balance in the plant fund as well. I foresee some dollars going in there uh, in the future. I think five to seven might actually be uh, on the lower side. Um, but, but, but first and foremost, you know, we have to deal with the exigency of the circumstances we're dealing with, and as a result, um, we're going to see how that plays out. Um, I think here in coming weeks as we close out um, close out the current books and open up the new books excuse me for fiscal 21 we're going to have a realization of, of what of what you're talking about and what I'm talking about here is those it, it can we shift at least some dollars to the plant fund so stay tuned uh, you you were uh, that's a very um, pertinent question and and I assure you that the team is taking notes on that to see if we can push at least some more dollars uh, into that plant fund. This again is um, we're just having to deal with the the exigency of, 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 of our circumstances. Okay, I, I understand what you're saying but my my understanding of the plant fund is that's for repairs to the existing plant. Uh, so the property. 
Whereas the new fund will be for crisis. Yeah. So, so. Is my understanding correct? So it's it's not only for a uh, physical plant per se. The plant funds um, are are built with more variability in there than just uh, facilities. Um, they're also built for equipment and or um, un un uh, other uh, one-time costs, primarily around physical. Uh, um, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, so can you please take us to the previous slide? It, I, I think it, it defines what the different categories is for the plant fund. Yes. So this is what uh, the discussion has happened in the past. Uh, we said we were going to allocate 4.2 million to the ERP system, and then for the Southside Campus FFNE 9.8. Uh, can this be expanded? I, I think Marks is indicating that yes, you know, we can definitely uh, continue to to assess uh, that in the near future. Uh, but I think our immediate needs is on the next slide is. We need to at least make sure that we have the financial flexibility to get us through this crisis and be ready for any new crisis. Next slide, Pete. And that's where this next uh, this next slide comes into play. It's the risk reserve funding on the next slide, please. There you go. So this is our, our, our if we were to take a, a risk assessment, this is probably the most immediate need and we already in, are in a crisis today, and we don't know what the next five years is going to look like. Again, these these categories. I, oh, I'm sorry. I, I totally agree with you. My concern is I'm I'm afraid we're going to be underfunded in the plant reserve fund. Uh, we're we're covering the crisis, but we're we're neglecting, or we're possibly neglecting the plant reserve fund by by depleting it, and that's my concern. Duly noted, Mr. Bennett, and I think um, that um, that we will definitely take uh, um, your words uh, to 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 the pencil and paper. And um, again, I am cautiously optimistic that we'll begin to put uh, slowly put some monies back in there. The other thing, too, based on what you're saying, uh, Regent Bennett, is that you know these these. Um, topics right here for the risk reserve fund. These uh, items or categories uh, could be expanded, and and uh, that, that in other words, uh, both buckets, if you will, can be connected if necessary. Because if there's an emergent cost that comes with a catastrophic change or or something in a that's needed out of the physical, uh, excuse me, out of the, out of the plant fund, um, if we have in this risk reserve fund another category that says and or other um, emergent or exigent circumstances as needed by the college, it, it, it could serve as a reserve to the, to, the, to, the, to the plant fund, if you will. In other words, if we hit a, a total crisis and a total emergency where we need those dollars, um, it could very well fall in this uh, category here. What this really does is just opens it up, really the, the, the same um, similar dollars uh, to the plant fund and broadening uh, the areas uh, for, for application is really what, what, what this is aspiring to do. But, but duly noted, and our, our team will put our heads together uh, in coming days in, in preparation to come back uh, for further discussion on how we can achieve exactly what you're saying so the depletion's not there. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other regents that have questions or comments uh, at this point in the presentation? I would like to, to follow up on what Regent Bennett um, was talking about. I'm wondering if as a part of the presentation on the Risk Reserve Fund, if you might be able to fold into that our other reserve funds and the applicable policies that guide each, how they're funded, how, they're, they're, uh, how monies are put into them, what the, the uses are, that would give us a an all an education, uh, a re-education about those reserve funds 
and we'd be able to see how the risk reserve fund differs from our other funds and how they're, how they're all held in balance and, and used and that sort of thing. I just think that would be helpful for all of us yes. to look at that in context. To, to, put, to, to juxtapose the two gr uh, funds next to each other in definition and so forth at the next meeting, I think, is, is, is what I'm making notes for. And so we're all on the same page there. So team, uh, let's, let's prepare to bring uh, uh, the policies behind and the definitions behind the plant fund as well as the risk reserve as we uh, move forward into coming meetings. Would that help us all out? Regent Bennett, do you think that would help? Yes, I do. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any questions from any other regents? If not, Mr. Garcia, please continue. Okay, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so with the exception of property taxes, the college has completed assessing the various data points influencing the 2021 budget plan for revenues. Let's go over those assumptions uh, for property taxes. Uh, our assumptions for property taxes will become more definitive when the college receives the certified appraisals from the office of the New Essex County Appraisal District, which is scheduled for July 25th. Please note, our recent discussions with the appraisal district suggest that our assumptions are within reason. In addition, the college is acting on the governor's recommendation that the college maintain mission critical services without placing a bigger burden on the taxpayer. The college has already uh, taken this to heart by reducing spending on, mis on non mission critical expenses categories and electricity expenses resulting from our new energy contract that uh, will result in uh, annual savings of 500,000 and as much as uh, 3,500,000 for the seven year period of the contract. There were all more to come on, on a separate presentation on this uh, electricity contract. Um, so these efforts have already resulted in a, result, uh, in a reduced MNO tax rate by six tenths of a penny for fiscal year 2021, and this is only the beginning. Later in this presentation, you will see a downward spiral on property taxes moving forward. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Oh no, I'm sorry, still within this slide. Moving on to state appropriations. In our last board meeting, the college reported on the governor's financial st stabilization plan that includes a 5% reduction in funding the good news is the governor's plan excludes community colleges. The governor has once again demonstrated his support for community colleges because he is looking to community college to prepare the workforce as we emerge from the current recessionary crisis. In addition, the governor's financial stability plan excludes funding for debt service requirements and bond authorizations. A copy of this communication can be found at the end of this PowerPoint presentation. Accordingly, our budget plan for state appropriations, insurance, and retirement revenues are flat. Next is tuition and fees. There are many variables to consider when planning for tuition and fees. Contract hours, I'm sorry, contact hours is one of them. The current summer contact hour is trending at 22% above last year's. As we just heard from our colleague, the college will continue to monitor the fall enrollment. I suspect the fall will trend upward similarly to the summer to enrollment. Historical enrollment trends is another variable. In the case of the 2008 recession, the Nuestas County unemployment rate peaked at a rate of 8.2% by May of 2010. During the same period from 2008 to 2000, uh, 2010, the college experienced a 15.8% increase in student contact hours. This trend is attributed in part to students retooling their skills at Del Mar College in order to regain entry into the workforce. The college believes we will experience similar enrollment patterns in our current recessionary environment in which the unemployment rate for the Nueces County reported by Workforce Solutions has scaled up from January's 4.5 to May, uh, to May, 14.6 percent. And as our co colleague already presented, summer is trending at 22 percent above last year in contact hours. So we're already seeing similar trends. 
Based on these data points, the college will take a conservative outlook and plan for a flat tuition and fee revenues based on a flat enrollment plus $2 tuition rate increase that was previously approved by the board in February. Uh, let's transition to the financial revenue budget on the next slide. Before you move on, Mr. Garcia. Yes, sir. Uh, if you could just go back real quick. I, I'd like to, um, Regents, are y'all hearing me okay? Is this better? Okay, let me, hold on. Is this, is this better? It's difficult. I'm having difficulty hearing you. Okay. Is this any better? Let me see what I can do to adjust. Is that better? Too f I'm getting fuzzy. Okay. How about that? Any better there? Less less feedback? Okay. Bear with me. Get all my accoutrements here. Is that any better? How about that? Further back? That's better? Okay, I'm getting the Okay, I'm, I'm adjusted. Thank you. So, Regents, very quickly, the, these three topics are, you know, we, we have to keep the continuity of the conversations from previous board meetings. And uh, I, I'm, I'm proud to say that our assessments, estimations, um, otherwise forecasts into uh, uh, prep, in preparing the, 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 the budget, budget for ultimate uh, uh, consideration for approval uh, is, is moving along uh, accordingly um, and uh, uh, accurately. Uh, tuition and fees, as you know, we continue to move ahead with a scenario of flat, as we're saying. Uh, th that's a really important item um, right there. Um, as I know Mr. Garcia used the term 22, used the, the number 22 percent. It was corrected at 17 percent uh, contact hours for, for uh, summer two. As you all know, I've got to remind you all that, that summer two is, um, excuse me, summer as a whole uh, is our um, greatest indicator and or uh, predictor uh, for preparing the budget for tuition and fees assumptions moving forward. We're in good stead is all I'm trying to say at this point and we know uh, there continues to be challenges and, and uh, very, very difficult challenges as we move ahead but uh, moving ahead with the flat uh, scenario is, uh, remains um, um, accurate and also um, important as we move ahead. Why? Because we do believe, um, um, as we've always said, in times of difficult financial crises, um, people come to the community college. People come to higher ed and especially the community college. And so in preparations, we, we, we do think that with a flat budget that there will be something more than flat. But what, what I'm also saying is those dollars, frankly, because of the crises coming, will be already spent, if you will. In other words, we will, we will need to prepare those dollars. Um, we will need to, um, w w we're not necessarily ahead, even though we will have an increase in enrollment, we believe, uh, for the fall semester and the sessions within the fall semester. So because of the inefficiencies that are coming, because of COVID-19 and, and the difficulty of, 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 of distancing and, and, and increased expenses and so forth, we're going to adhere to that flat, that mentality that, that, that fiscally speaking, that, that, that all things are even and, and hopefully, hopefully things are awash. The other thing is, too, that those any dollars that come in above a flat case scenario can also be used in future uh, moved to uh, the future um, 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 risk reserve funds and or plant funds. The other piece is real, very quickly, um, just a slight adjustment to what Mr. Garcia said, although he is accurate, the state appropriations, uh, the governor has left this out of the 5% reduction uh, for all state entities. That's, that, that is, I, I got to qualify that by saying, and it's only, and that is for the current biennium of which we're, which, which speaks to the next fiscal only. After that, uh, it, it's just a point of clarification, and I know Mr. Garcia knows this extremely well. Um, after that is when things are going to get really difficult. The tax assumptions are straightforward. We, we're ver working very closely with the, uh, uh, um, Mr. Canales and others, and um, we continue to be, I, I say, even more conservative than the figures that they're giving us there. So I just had to chime in and talk about the continuity of the things that we've been discussing 
and uh, uh, from previous meetings and making sure um, that this conversation uh, is not separate from others. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, moving on to the next slide, please. Okay. So as you can see on this slide, the 2021 revenue budget will remain the same relative to prior fiscal year at 170, 107 point nine million based on the underlying assumptions that we just presented. Next slide, please. Okay. So uh, I wanna start uh, with, uh, I wanna thank Madam Chair, Mr. President, members of the board and the college community for your continued support. The college has been able to adjust uh, to this new adverse uh, financial environment in a manner to secure the long-term sustainability of the college while uh, attempting to reduce the tax burden. So the next two uh, property tax lights have a wealth of information with a headliner that we are nearing a pivotal point whereby the tax burden will begin to spiral down. It begins in fiscal year 2021 with the m and tax rate reduced by six tenths of a penny. This is attributed to the college measure to reduce spending and a new energy contract that will save the college 500,000 per year for a total 3.5 million over the seven year contract period. Another key takeaway on this slide relates to capital financing for two voter approved bond elections that dates back to November 4, 2014 and November 8, 2016 for various campus wide capital projects and the South campus. In essence, this capital investment will provide well into the future access to affordable degree and certificate of programs, customized, customized workforce development, and continued education opportunities for the successful educational advancement and lifelong learning needs of the citizens of Nueces County. The debt service tax rate change in fiscal year 2019 and 2020 is attributed to this uh, new capital financing. I'm also, I, I must also add, the timing of the 220, 2020 bonds were issued in a very low interest rate environment. The total interest cost rate for the 2020 bond issuance relative to the 2018 bond issues resulted in financing cost savings of $1.2 million for the first year and 17.8 million for the life of the of the bond issues. The 17.8 million financing cost savings will go a long way with reducing the taxpayer's burden. This information also makes for a good argument for a homeowner to assess, and I emphasize for a homeowner to assess if it makes sense for them to refinance their home mortgage to reduce their payment and possibly reduce the number of years on their existing mortgage. But again, I'm no expert. Uh, please seek professional advisement on this. If there are no questions, we can move forward, uh, move to the next tax rate forecast on, on the next slide. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, there are three key takeaways on this slide. One is the tax burden will begin to spiral down resulting in a 10% reduction in the total tax rate by fiscal year 2025. This reduced tax burden is uh, attributed in part to maturity, maturing general obligations in fiscal year 2023 and 2025 valued at $54 million. This is only the beginning. The next drop in our obligations will occur in fiscal year 2028 with the maturity of the 2016 revenue bonds valued at $15 million. The grand total of these maturities is $69 million by fiscal year 2028, just around the corner. Another key takeaway is that there will be steady increases in expenses with financial resource allocation to fund mission critical operating activities moving forward. Operating expenses will be monitored and adjusted 
throughout the year with any immediate response to any adverse effects on the college's finances. In addition, the, reserve, the risk reserve fund will also be leveraged to manage unforeseeable adverse financial conditions. Last item, the 2021 property tax for the average taxable homestead valued at 172,000 is $478 and it will scale down to 390 by fiscal year 2025. This represents an 18% savings for the homeowner. If there are no other questions, Jackie will lead us into the 2021 M&O expense budget discussion on the next slide. I do have a question about the, this is Regent Scott, about the assumptions for the uh, M&O tax reduction over the next five years. Okay, uh, very good question. I'm going to ask uh, our controller, John Johnson, to chime in and, and respond uh, to that question. John? Thank you, Mr. Garcia. The assumptions that we used were, were pretty much similar to what we have been using. They take into consideration a 3% property value each year. I have maintained the 1% decrease in tax in, in tax collections and, and a $300 million um, new construction each year. So it's, it's the same criteria for each year going forward. And that's assuming that uh, the, on the expense side that we'll be able to cover all of our expenses uh, based on the risk reserve fund and the other scenarios that you have just outlined? Yes. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? You may continue. Thank you. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to now ask uh, Jackie uh, Landrum to chime in and talk about our next slide presentation. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you go to the next slide, please? I will now go over the preliminary expense budget for fiscal year 2021. Del Mar College is very cognitive and aware of the critical situation in our community. And as you can see, our MO budget uh, definitely reflects this. The college is focused on lessening the tax burden during this crisis by reducing the M&O budget and funding mission critical costs by reallocating resources. The costs include the potential employee compensation, the election expense, increased insurance and utilities for the new buildings. And although the net decrease in our non-salary categories ends up being about 964,000, we really reallocated a little over 2.2 million to fund these mission critical costs. The categories that you're gonna see the largest impacts in include supplies, maintenance and repairs, consultants, contract labor, travel, professional development, and miscellaneous. We do not expect a lot of people to be traveling next year due to COVID-19, so we have actually reallocated 71% of that budget. And by using these cost saving strategies, we are following the governor's letter, encouraging agencies not to or to avoid travel and to not spend uh, funds on administrative costs that are not mission critical if we can go to the next slide you'll see that this is just a continuation of the effects of our resource reallocation and do we have any questions on these two i have a question yes sir the employee benefits decreased how were we able to achieve that we actually, during our analysis, uh, John and I decided that we were a little over budgeted in that area. So we decided that we could go ahead and decrease it. Plus our insurance premiums are not gonna increase this year. So we had some savings there. Okay, and how about the maintenance and repairs? That looks like a pretty substantial decrease. That was another area that we compared and looked at how spending had been in the prior years and we had a little bit of savings. So we just tried to pull that savings and reallocate it to other areas in need. Yeah, you know, just just for clarity, I, I want to make sure that uh, you know th this was a, a, a college-wide effort. You know, we, we went back to the various budget stakeholders, and uh, we had asked them to take a closer look at their 
uh, spend and scale back as much as we can, and they came through, and this is the result of that. And Mr. Bennett, uh, some of the things, uh, I think you had a question on, on, uh, on salaries. You know, part of the scale back is, is uh, delaying some of the higher, you know, having a hiring freeze and uh, only hiring those mission critical positions that's gonna take us through the next one, one to two years as well. So, so that's part of the strategy is, uh, uh, for, for scaling back the salaries as well. So Jackie, thank you very much. Um, as a final note on this slide, uh, this financial plan hedges, hinges on establishing a risk reserve fund uh, to provide the college with financial flexibility to navigate through any other crisis that may came up that may come up uh, over the next five years, or at least in this pers from this perspective, in fiscal year 2021, over the next 12, 12 to 15 months. Uh, if there's any other questions, uh, we can move uh, to the next slide. Just a quick comment, Mr. Garcia. Yes, sir. Regents, I've switched masks. Is this better? Is it? Okay, thank you. So, uh, again, the, the importance of, of emphasizing the cuts that have been made uh, through the M&O budget, um, that's, what, that's what we survive on on a regular basis. That's how we operate. Maintenance and operations is what M&O stands for for the folks out there watching. And so we have made those cuts. Uh, again, we feel very, very at, at a time where enrollment is going up, we're still cutting in preparation, okay? And so that's a real difficult thing to do, uh, but, but, but I want to th uh, thank the team for, for taking those steps and not only following um, uh, your, uh, the, the, the leadership of this group of Board of Regents, but uh, also adhering to as a part of, of, of the state of Texas, uh, what, what, our, what our leadership is asking for over there. Again, um, they've asked us to consider, uh, to, to strongly, uh, strongly urged us to cut in the area of maintenance and operations, and, and, uh, to, and, and that is very different from INS. In other words, the, uh, the, 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 the debt and, and, and the, the interest in sinking uh, side of the account um, is, is, is separate. And the, and the governor has made it very clear that he's not talking about that particular piece. In other words, uh, he, he's even given us the green light to continue to, to move ahead um, on, that, on that front to fund uh, the, the existing bonds and so forth. But also to make that cut on the M&O side. We did, we have sacrificed. I want, the, I want the community to also understand that, that we did make cuts. We made extensive cuts on that side of the house and that's not a small matter. And I dare say we're not quite done yet. I think we're largely done, almost completely done, um, but there's always tweaks to be made up until the last minute going into um, the final budget meeting next month. Thank you, Regents. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, so, uh, so thank you, Jackie. Uh, I think we can move on to the next uh, the next slide, please. Okay. So, as uh, Jackie previously mentioned, the college continues to fund mission critical operating activities. One of them is employee compensation. The college understands the importance of recruiting and retaining our valued employees. So the college has allocated financial resources for employee compensation valued at 750,000. This includes faculty compensation of 505,000 and exempt and non-exempt compensation of 245,000. There are no other questions on this slide. John and Jackie will lead us into the college's financial forecast discussion on the next slide. Mr. Garcia, I, I have to add a couple of things here, or at least one thing. Um, again, Regents, we understand the very difficult uh, scenario and circumstances that, uh, that, that our, our community is facing, and, and this is, a most, this is a, a about as modest a, a, a consideration for increase in, in, in salaries um, that we could put on the table. We put it on some weeks ago, and we continue to move ahead with, with sensitivity and feedback, um, with sensitivity for the feedback that may come from uh, you all as representatives of the community. Um, I, I have to be very candid here and I have to be very frank and it's, it's, it's a, uh, you know, as modest as it is, I know there are many institutions across the state that aren't giving any and some that are giving more. 
And um, but I I, uh, I I you know if, if if the feedback doesn't come today, if there you have any other concerns or questions, uh, considerations, pro or con, uh, please give uh, let me know. Um, again, to the to the employees of the college, there's nobody here on this call today that wouldn't want um, greater consideration for for uh, your 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 uh, raising your, your your salaries and so forth. But it's the most obvious uh, circumstances, I think, under the current crisis, uh, economic crisis that's being driven by by these 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 terrible things that are going on out there that are really driving this decision. Um, so I just have to make those comments and 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 I just want to let the employees know how much we appreciate you, how much we appreciate all that you're doing, and 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 just know that um, um, the times are extraordinarily are extraordinary. And uh, that's where this consideration and this number is coming from. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Escamilla, for bringing that up. I think it is uh, important, and on behalf of the Board of Regents, I need to, to echo what you said. Uh, in th given the uh, lack of certainty about the future and, and what the next, the next fiscal year is going to, to bring about and, and looking, looking to be good stewards of the taxpayer dollars uh, and of our student tuition and fees over the next several years. I think it is on incumbent upon us to be conservative. But given that, being able to show a token of, um, a token of gratitude towards what our faculty and staff have done over the last few months that has been remarkable, uh, the, the uh, work that has gone into moving these teaching modalities online and, and remotely, and, and they have just done great work. And so thank you for bringing that up. I think it's a very important point to bring up. Thank you. I, I would also just add, if I may, that um, we all have to get ready for tougher years coming. Um, this year is not, gonna, is not as tough as w what next year and probably the year after will be. The next biennium is going to be a much more difficult conversation, and we need to begin being candid, frank, and, and, and sensitive to all involved as we move ahead in future conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. John Johnson, will you please lead us into the uh, next uh, slide presentation? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. <clears throat> First off, the risk reserve is not really part of, of the budget of that's going forward. I'm sorry? Uh, next slide. I can go on the old one. Next slide, please. After this one, there we go. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry again for interrupting. Please continue. No, no, no problem. Thank you. Of course, the risk reserved of five to seven million is not really part of the budget assumptions. It's a, as as was explained before, it's for future risks. The tuition and fee assumptions we were showing for each year going forward a two dollar per semester hour. Uh, tuition increase, which we felt was modest. Um, the enrollment projections um, will be updated. Will be updated over the coming years, but based on the current available information, we are keeping those flat. The taxes we have reduced our collection tax rates for each of the uh, years going forward down to 95 percent, a 1 percent decrease from the previous year, and we're also also showing a 3% increase in taxable values. Um, the, the state, the college is planning for a state funding reduction in fiscal years 22 through 25 as a result of the economic recession, recession with the deepest impacts, uh, deepest cuts occurring for years 22 and 23. We, 22 and 23, we are projecting a 10% decrease in state appropriations. And for years 24 and 25, we are um, at least anticipating a 5%, um, hopefully a 5% increase in, in appropriations for years 24 and 25. Any questions? Thank you, uh, John. Uh, Jackie, if you could talk a little bit more on the expense side of the business. Yes, sir. Thank you. So for the assumptions on the expense side, we did go ahead and incorporate 2% salary increases each year for full-time faculty exempt and full-time non-exempt. 
However, that's totally preliminary and may change in the coming years based on the best available information at that time. On the non-salary categories, most of the categories were averaging a little over a 2% increase. For utilities, we're averaging a 4.6% increase each year. And then supplies and library, we're averaging a little over 5% increase for each year. And we did use the Higher Education Price Index as a reference for coming up with these calculations. And then lastly, due, the, due to the newly negotiated energy contract, we are, do have 125,000 savings for fiscal year 2021 and a $500,000 savings for the future years after that. Are there any questions on the expenses? Thank you, Jackie and John. Uh, one last point on these assumptions. Uh, all these uh, assumptions hinges on the college leveraging the risk reserve fund to manage unforeseeable adverse financial conditions throughout or possibly even following the current crises. Uh, if we can transition to the next slide. Yeah, so, so I, I try not to repeat myself, but I think this information is worthy of a repeat. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna begin my spiel again. There are three key takeaways on this slide. One is the tax burden will be spiraling down, resulting in a 10% reduction in the total tax rate by fiscal year 2021. This reduced tax burden is attributed in part to maturing general obligations in fiscal year 2023 and 2025 valued at 54 million. This is only the beginning. The next drop in our obligations will occur in fiscal year 2028 with the maturity of the 2016 revenue bonds valued at 15.1 million. The grand total of these maturities is 69 million by fiscal year 2028. Another key takeaway is there will be steady increases in expenses with financial resource allocation to fund mission critical operating activities moving forward. Operating expenses will be monitored and adjusted throughout the year with an immediate response to any adverse effects on the college's finances. In addition, the risk reserve fund will also be leveraged, leveraged to manage unforeseeable adverse financial conditions. Lastly, the 2010, uh, 2021 property tax for an average taxable homestead valued at 172,000 is 478,000. This will scale down by uh, to, to three hundred and ninety dollars by fiscal year twenty twenty five. This represents a, 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 an eighteen percent savings for the homeowner. John, uh, is there something you might, may want to add regarding these uh, combined tax rates? Um, I, I think it's it's because of the reduction in the debt service rate. It, it's um, going over in the future. Year, future years is um, reduced, um, given us some leverage in future years. Should we see increased expenditures because our overall rate um, going forward is going to remain about the 25% level after year um, 25? Um, and with increased enrollment, anticipated enrollment growth, I think we're in a great position going forward. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Uh, I think there's a couple of more slides. I'm guessing we are on page 15 now. Uh, next one, please. Thank you. I'm sorry, uh, if, if we can go on back one more. Thank you, John. I'm wondering if there's any questions on this slide. Okay, moving on. Uh, next um, slide, please. Uh, so what you have uh, here is a five-year financial forecast based on the underlying assumptions that uh, we just presented. The key takeaways um, on this um, presentation uh, is as follows. The college foresees downward pressures in state-funded revenues in fiscal years 2022 and 2023 driven by current recession crises. The tuition revenue will trend upward due to expected enrollment growth driven in part by students attending Del Mar College to retool their skills to re-enter the workforce. However, we will plan conservatively in our financial figures. 
No new property taxes is more common in the foreseeable future, which means steady increases in prop steady increases in property taxes in an effort to reduce the, the tax burden. Lastly, in an effort to balance the budget relative to our revenue projections, there will be steady increases in expenses with financial resource allocation to fund mission critical operating activities. In addition, expenses will be monitored throughout the crisis if, and if necessary, will be adjusted. It is important to note that the risk reserve fund will be leveraged to manage unforeseeable adverse financial conditions in the near future. If there are no questions on this slide, I will transition to the final slide, which is on the uh, budget calendar. I do have a question. Yes, sir. That line item South Campus, uh, is that all the incremental cost to operate that South Campus? So, uh, based on our last um, revision of, of our forecast, this is what it's looking today. Uh, we will be working with an advisor to provide us uh, some updated demographics that will uh, probably add to some changes in this number. Uh, one of what's different today is, uh, you know, uh, we received some marching orders whereby we're looking to uh, leverage uh, current uh, staff resources uh, uh, at the Southside campus. So that's going to help uh, try to keep the cost uh, at lower levels. So Mr. Bennett, if I may add, um, the, the, ex the, the, the campus doesn't uh, fully open and, and go online uh, until uh, 2022. And um, as such, I think the numbers are very much um, in line with, with the costs associated with that. Uh, preliminary numbers, I think going back to previous board meetings uh, that we talked about were upwards of, of three and a half, three and a half million dollars when fully, uh, fully um, um, staffed with, with employees um, and, and um, full loads of students. Uh, that that number would support uh, the 3,500 students to I think 4,500 students. So the 3.5 number uh, continues to be kind of that target, that that the higher end of the target. But for the campus to open up, um, to, we're, we're we're comfortable at this point with with the uh, the numbers that we have there uh, for uh, fiscal year 2022. That th those are those are startup numbers basically. Okay, I, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm, I just think those numbers look low, and I'm concerned about that. Thank you. Well, I, I, I just thank you for that. I, I just like to just add clarity. It, it goes, it goes back to um, utilizing because of the, the the financial crises that we're in and, and, and the stabilization. We're going in um, with more existing positions. It has more to do with consolidation of the positions um, that I've been um, um, working on here as of late. And so um, I appreciate that, and we'll, we'll watch that very closely. The number can go up. Or we're we're, we're going to do everything we can to, to adhere to as low a number as possible. Um, and I, that being said, it's the, 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 where, where the restrictions really are coming are in the way of support staff, um, because we don't get to hold back on, on the faculty um, uh, positions there. They're the ones that are going to be needed uh, first and foremost for, for us to get around and support. So uh, more to come on that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, moving on to the next slide, final slide. I thank you for being patient. Uh, so uh, I would like to introduce some uh, new calendar dates for the month of August. The changes uh, for the month of August are driven from last year's Texas property tax code revisions that go into effect this, this year. Three of last year's meetings have been consolidated into one meeting based on the revised property tax code 26.06 Part D. Last year's two public hearings and the meeting to approve the property tax levy have been consolidated into one meeting. Let's go over the new calendar dates. So on August the 3rd, on August the 3rd, the board will meet on two action items. One action item is to adopt an order to conduct a public hearing planned for August 17th 
regarding the 2020 and 2021 college budget. The second is to adopt an order to conduct a public hearing once again, planned for August 17. This time it's regarding the proposed property tax changes. On this date, the college will also deliver a budget workshop uh, to, to the board. The next date is August the 11th. The college will have a regular board meeting uh, that will also include a budget update. On August the 17th, the college will hold the public hearings that will allow the public to present their views on the property taxes and the budget. Thereafter, action items will be presented to the board for consideration. That includes adopting the m and and the debt service uh, budget. The other action item is adopting the tax rates. And then the third item is adopting the common years, the coming years uh, tax ex exemptions. If there are no other questions, this concludes the budget update presentation. Are there other questions or comments? Uh, Delia, I would, uh, I think I've asked you this before, but just if you will update the board on the times for um, each of those board meetings. And so regents note that on August the 3rd, that's a Monday, we will have uh, the final budget workshop. So we'll see final numbers in that workshop uh, that will be published and ready for uh, for us to go to the, the rest of the public hearings and our action item uh, later in the month. Do we have times for those meetings yet? Any of those? That's why I asked Delia to send those to us so that we have the dates and times um, and the general topics for each one in, in a comprehensive email from her. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Garcia. Appreciate uh, all of that work uh, and keeping us updated. Um, I'm going to just call on Regent Estrada to see if she had any. Um, but I, I think she is having difficulty with her audio, so she's going to call back in on the phone if she has specific questions uh, throughout the course of the meeting. When we get to action items, Regent Estrada, we're probably going to need you to be on the phone so that we can hear votes on, on specific things. So uh, Mr. Garcia is going to come back and give us a quick update on the electrical service con contract. We had heard some, uh, some mentionings of this in previous meetings, and he's going to give us a quick report on that. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. So, uh, judging by the tone, I, I'm, I'm sure you're sensing I'm running out of batteries here. Uh, but let's get started on the staff report on the electric service contract. Uh, the college is currently in the middle of navigating through the COVID-19 and the recessions whereby the financial implications to the college is not definitive. There are many experts with different perspectives on how long the recession will last. What is certain today is that there will be down there will be downward pressures on the college's state funding that may possibly last through the end of fiscal year 2025. That has accelerated discussions around cost reduction efforts, which include electricity costs to maintain the college's financial stability uh, at a minimum throughout the crisis. So uh, let's start with the historical electricity costs on the next slide. <laughs> I'm sorry, was there a question there? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started on this slide. Regent Estrada, are you trying to connect? Yes, ma'am, I'm trying to connect. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am, we can, but I think you've got two audios on. Can you hear me, uh, Rachel Scott? Yes. If you could turn off the audio on your computer and just use audio on your phone. Uh, 
Bye-bye. Very good. Thank you. Uh-oh. You're good. You're good. Okay. Okay, so if, uh, if, if, uh, if you're not, uh, I'm going to ask you to please uh, t turn off your mic if, if there are no any questions. I'm, I'm, I am hearing an echo here. Thank you. Okay, great. So let's get started on this slide. Our current electricity contract with Constellation will expire in May of 2021. It is uh, for the purchase of electricity for all of our locations except for the Northwest Center at a rate of five cents per kilowatt hour. The Northwest Center is serviced by Nuestra's Electricity Cooperative at a rate of six cents per kilowatt hour, which is significantly high relative to uh, the current rate. Uh, or the new contract rate. Accordingly, um, uh, our discussion with advisors, uh, the electricity service for the Northwest Center is still considered regulated and would not qualify for the competitive electricity supplier. However, the college will work with our advisor to assess the overall fees category for possible savings. In addition, uh, the college will take a closer look at lease agreements to determine if electricity costs can be negotiated into the next lease agreement. Here's a little bit more information about the college's electricity consumption. Based on the college's review of electricity expenses from February 2019 to January 2020, the college consumed 33 million kilowatts per year at an annual cost of $2.6 million. This includes electricity cost of 1.6 million and other fees of 910,000. The other fees category includes transmission, transition, distribution, congestion, and taxes, which makes up about 90% of the 910,000, as you can see in this uh, second to the last column of numbers. These fees are not fixed and are subject to change. In today's market conditions, Tradition Energy, the college's advisor, has secured on behalf of the college a new electricity contract resulting in significant cost reductions for the college. I will shortly provide more information about Tradition's Energy, uh, the college's utility advisor. The new electricity contract with TXE Energy, the college's new electricity service provider, it's scheduled to start next year, May of 2021. Uh, there's more information on TXU on the next slide. Uh, before I transition, uh, are there any questions on this slide? Mr. Garcia? Yes, sir. Uh, West Campus and Center for Economic Development, are those mislabeled? Oh my goodness, uh, yes, that is definitely my mistake. Thank you for uh, for that. I will definitely correct that in our in our next presentation. Okay, thank you, sir. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Uh, yep. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Moving on to the next slide, please. But in total, we're there. You know. Okay. All righty. Uh, the college has recently contracted with Traditions Energy, an energy consulting and management service company, through the U.S. Communities Cooperative Purchasing Program. The, must, the master agreement on file with the cooperative requires Traditions Energy to manage an efficient procurement process, whereby energy suppliers compete for Del Mar College's electricity's business. Other services under the master agreement includes contract review and, negoti and, and negotiation uh, assistance. Traditions Energy assisted the college with obtaining competitive bids from various electricity suppliers, including the ones listed on this slide. TXU's energy bid stood out from the group with an 84-month electricity contract at a reduced electricity rate of three cents per kilowatt hour. This represents a 30% reduction from the current contract rate of five cents per kilowatt hour. This will save the college an estimated 500,000 per year and 3.5 million for the duration of the new seven year contract. In addition, 
a tradition energy negotiated an energy efficient rebate called Greenback valued at 48000 These dollars can be used towards energy efficiency improvements at the college such as uh, the installation of LED lighting or water lines to reduce water usage. If there are no questions, uh, Mr. Da David Davila will, will lead us into the discussions on uh, a little bit more on tradition energy. Good afternoon. Tradition Energy is an independent energy risk management and procurement advice and service company. Sorry, David. Uh, sorry to interrupt. That would be on our next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, sorry about Thank that, you. David. Can you please no continue? Problem. It's been a company that has been in operation since 1986. They have over 2,300 employees and operate in 29 countries. One of Traditions Energy's taglines is that 95% of their clients say that Traditions recommendations are making a positive contribution to their enterprise. Del Mar College, we put them to the test. We did a survey to four other clients, all of which are Texas Community Colleges, and this is how they responded. Temple Junior College, they wrote, we contracted with them because they seem to have a better uh, or the most knowledge of energy market. Alvin Community College wrote, Bob and their staff with tradition are very reliable and thoughtful, and they ensure that the college needs are met. They also wrote, there were many reasons for contracting with tradition, including pricing, data analytics, and reporting. San Jacinto College wrote, the college looked at several other consultants and co-ops options, and finally, the level of tradition's energy professionalism and quality of their data was in part their selling point. In addition, Tradition provided the college an example of their weekly market reports that includes research information with a short and long-term outlook of their energy market and data influences on prices. Their data influencers include energy production, demand, storage, capital investment, and Bob Wooden, our advisor, he provided information around energy mix for creating an electricity such as solar, wind, coal, liquid natural gas over the next last 10 years and a forward outlook to the energy mix with the possibility that the new technology improvements such as battery storage could potentially change the energy mix. It is important to note that Tradition Energy also delivers webinars with the industry content and best practices. The most recent webinar that I did myself was on finding and obtaining incentives with rebates for energy efficiency projects and this was very helpful in negotiating the energy efficiency rebate with TXU Energy, which was valued at $48,000. It is evident that Tradition Energy has a good pulse in the energy space, which gives them a competitive advantage. The fact that they share their market research with the college, that will allow us to continue to make data-driven decisions. That is why they are a sound strategic partner. Thank you. Do you have any questions? I don't Mr. Garcia, I'll turn it back to you. Yes. If there are no other questions, this concludes our presentation on uh, the um, electricity contract. Thank you very much. I don't see any questions. Thank you both for your work on that. Thank you. Now we're going to switch gears and give Mr. Garcia a break and uh, <laughs> talk about, have a staff report on our Manual of Policies and Procedures, uh, the project that staff has been working on internally for the last several months. Ms. Tammy McDonald is going to give us an update on that. Yes, thank you. I'll take us to a quick review of what has been presented to the board previously so that we can refresh our memories. In October of 2019, a draft board policy B3.16 was presented to the Board of Regents. At that particular time, that policy remained in draft. In November of 2019, the Manual of Policies and Procedures um, project, like a project outline, was provided to the board in November. I believe, uh, Regent Scott, you, you presented this yourself. And we um, kept the draft policy, the B3.16, we kept that in draft, and it remains as a working document. Thank you, I couldn't see that. It remains as a working document um, during our project phase. Administration is scheduled to conduct a review of the Manual of Policies and Procedures for FY21 to include 
uh, policies in place to comply with federal, state, and accrediting bodies, the manual structure, policy format, placement, and then also the, uh, a schedule, like a formal schedule for board review. Next slide, please. And also in November, we provided a uh, project review and timeline to the Board of Regents. What was presented was from January of 2020 through August of 2020. Administration was to assign primary policy owners to all B policies. That project is in process and is near completion. Administration to determine best practice to conduct review and engage external expertise as needed. That is also in process. And then September, October, anticipate um, the beginning of the project. And that is also where, so we have met our timelines, what was presented to the board previously. Next slide, please. To also provide you with some information that we do, you know, we do have current uh, policy review in, in place to either revise a policy or to add a new policy. Of course, if it's a state or federal mandate, which we bring those to you as needed and often, um, accreditation requirements. I think that you probably can remember the, over the last couple of years, bringing quite a few that was due to our SAC COC accreditation uh, work that we've been doing. Also, our internal audit with Weaver. Anytime Weaver would come in and audit a function, if, um, they would also review the policies that were in place to, to look at them for compliance and also suggest best practices. So I do recall bringing quite a few policies to the board that began with, as a result of the internal audit from Weaver, this is a revision that we are recommending to the board. So quite a few of those have been brought to the board in the last several years. And of course, at the request of the board, the CEO, administration, or a council. So those are some things that we already are in place in conducting policy review. Next slide, please. So I would like to go over his next steps. So since this is an FY21 project, our next, next steps would be between September and December of 2020, that to conduct a board policy workshop in September of 2020. It would include the FY21 board action plan from the May 2020 board retreat. And I am suggesting to go over chapters one and two. Those are cover some of the topics that were a result of your board retreat, like the review of bylaws. So those chapters would be in, uh, encompassing some of the things on your action plan. Also continue review of the draft policy that had been presented last fall. Set policy priorities based on the board workshop and as mandated by state, federal, and accrediting bodies um, following those regulations and guidelines. Develop a policy review schedule, a formal policy review schedule. There's a sample on the next slide. And then engage external expertise as appropriate. And we'll be bringing back some information and recommendation on um, engaging that external expertise and possibly um, going ahead and continuing to use Weaver in their capacity since they have conducted quite a few policy reviews already. So we will be bringing some additional information back to the board at a later date. And then the last slide is, is this sample or the example of what a formal um, policy review schedule could look like. I'm not saying this is what we'll use, but this is just a sample of what we would put together based on um, all the information I just provided in the um, next steps. Do you have any questions? I do have a question for you, and I'll invite other board members to, to unmute if they have questions. Uh, at the September workshop that you are suggesting, um, I assume that you are looking to do that the morning of our regular meeting. Is that correct, or would that be a good assumption? Yes. Okay. Yes, it would be a workshop, separate workshop from the regular board meeting. But probably the same day of, just the morning. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And, and there, there'll be another topic there for the workshop if you're looking at timing issues. Gotcha. Okay. We have KPIs also. Madam Chair, can you hear me? This is Brianna. Yes. Go ahead. Madam Chair, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. This is Bridget Estrada. Can you hear me? Yes, can Elva. Can you hear me? Yes, Elva. Uh, okay, I just wanted to make sure I, I think somebody just had a question I wanted to ask on the date. Yes, just wanted to ask, but somebody has answered my question. Just wanted to check on the date for the workshop, the policy workshop, but somebody has already asked or answered my question. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure you could hear me. Thank you, Regent. So uh, I'll ask Delia to add that to her list of upcoming dates for us to, uh, to keep on our calendar open. 
I would also, um, my question to you, Ms. McDonald, is who is going to facilitate that workshop? How do we anticipate that workshop running? That particular workshop is something that's in process, and I will be working through Dr. Escamilla, and we will be developing the outline and the process for that workshop, of course, with your input. Okay. We anticipate, we anticipate that the uh, participants there would um, likely be uh, all involved, including those, uh, the leadership from Weaver that have been working with us as well. Okay. So we can bring them and roll them into that workshop and, and, uh, and prepare uh, the calendar for the, for, for the foreseeable future with them. So I'd like to ask Regents, uh, it's, it's two months away, but if you have specific thoughts on, uh, you don't even ha don't have to match it to an existing policy, but if you'd like to make sure that something is covered in existing policy or suggestions for a new policy and a bullet point or two, uh, however much information you want to suggest, please send that to me, and I will work with staff to uh, get those ideas incorporated. That doesn't mean we can't come up and brainstorm the day of and, and have some consensus on policy development and revisions, but if you do know in advance there are topics you'd like to make sure we discuss, please let me know. Are there other regions who have questions or comments on this item? All right, thank you, Ms. McDonald. And there's nothing else on that. Uh, we are going to move on to our uh, 2014 bond update. President Escamilla, do you have some comments to start? Very quickly, uh, this again it continues is, is, a, is a continuation of the conversation to uh, finish up on the uh, 14 bond projects. And I say finish up because we're there's still much work to, to ahead of us. Today, Mr. Stribos, uh, Vice President for Physical Facilities and and, and Operations, along with Doug Lowe, um, um, are going to help us uh, move through. Uh, the conversation regarding the programming. In other words, the purposes of, of the spaces uh, in, in front of us. Uh, we've described it budgetarily last, last month, and this time we're describing the programming. The next step for, for, the, uh, for the sake of continuity after this would be uh, the assignment of uh, the, the, the selections and assignments of uh, uh, the, the uh, design teams and then on, and then preparing for bids. So we'll, we'll talk about a little bit of, we'll talk about procurement as well. But that being said, Mr. Stribos, are you with us? Yes, sir, I am. All right, uh, and, and we're all familiar with Doug Lowe. I, we, we saw a picture of him out there. We're, we're all familiar with Mr. Lowe, if you recall. He is a facilities programming group that, uh, that has helped us with our programming from, um, um, from um, way back now and um thank you mr stravos please take over okay so this is uh, in response to a request from my presentation from last month you see the cover slide and doug low and facility programming has done a, a good job of the programming and they're going to take over on this presentation and we'll as a team answer specific questions that you have uh doug this is your presentation now okay thank you um and greetings to all uh after listening to some of the very important topics uh, related to budget and cost and procedures, uh, I can tell you with a great deal of enthusiasm that the next few slides are going to be much more exciting. This is really good news for the future of the East Campus. Um, so let's get into it. Next slide, please. Um, we are going to talk about the the building renovations on East Campus, and I'm going to talk about what's included in a program. Programming, uh, as I have told you before, means different things in different disciplines, and when it comes to college campus design and architecture, it simply means figuring out what problems you're going to solve before you come up with a design solution to solve them. Um, this slide presents in very summary form the kinds of information that is included in a program. Obviously, the, the sign-offs and the executive summary, but it is grounded, a program uh, for a building renovation is grounded in the vision and goals and things that are so important to the college. And then it moves on to site issues, things that impact the building, both in the, uh, in the ground and other types of infrastructure. Inside the building, space and adjacency requirements. We talk to the users 
uh, and understand what is needed to create a functional project and how to, to solve uh, and provide needed space, and then balance the scope and the budget. Next slide. Because this project, um, or the, the 2014 bond, touches so many buildings on the East Campus, I refer to this as a bit of gaming. So I think you'll see what I mean as we move into it. Next slide, please. The slide five map is an over or a bird's eye view of the East Campus. And you can see the colored buildings and the yellow boxes begin to sort of paint the picture of everything that's going on. And we have made a recommendation to approach the 2014 bond projects or to cluster them in three phases. And with your permission, I'm going to jump in feet first, right in the middle in phase two. Uh, also in the middle of the campus. And the reason I want to do this is because the renovation of Heldenfels or the conversion of Heldenfels from an administration building into a one-stop, first-stop enrollment center is going to be so transformational for the campus. As you know, many students, particularly those who are in an at-risk situation, don't feel like they belong or don't feel like they have the skills to navigate how to register and matriculate for their college education. And so being able to create this one place on campus that is welcome and inviting uh, can truly be both inspirational and transformational for many students' lives. So Heldenfels and the conversion is one of the keys for the future of the campus. Next, I'm going to jump up to phase three, a little bit further north, up the other end of the mall, to Harvard, the student center. Um, this building was built before many of your students, perhaps all of your students, were born. And it's time to refresh and reimagine the student center uh, for the 21st century student. So if you can picture the 2014 bond as with these two anchors, the new one-stop center at the south end of the mall and the re-envisioned student center at the north end, you can begin to capture just the possibilities that this, these bond projects are going to bring. Now, in order to make both of those happen, I'll move down to phase one, which revolves around a memorial and converting that into a consolidated administration building. It has two primary benefits. One, it's very functional and efficient to get administration in one spot. They are scattered across the campus now. But it also sets the stage and allows for the conversion of Eldenfels and also for the, the renovations in Harvard. So next slide, please. I'm going to go through the phasing quickly. Um, we can stop and get into the weeds at any time. But on slide six, it talks about what had to happen prior to even phase one beginning, and when the new general, uh, general academic and music building came online, that set the stage for renovations in the, uh, in the other fine arts and music. So when the new building came online, people migrated over to it, and that's, that allowed us to renovate um, the existing building. Next slide, please. This is on slide seven, it talks a bit more about that. You can see the fine arts and music with the red circle around it. What I just described, that, that, that was necessary to provide adequate classroom space and office space as the other renovations began to occur. Uh, Heritage Hall is also identified as a dotted line because that building has been identified as a candidate for demolition. And so uh, that will come in phase one as well. Next slide. Slide eight. This is a glimpse of inside a program of requirements. Um, and this, again, is summary level information for each one of the projects, which you can see for fine arts and music renovation that I just described. On the left-hand side is a table of spaces. On the right-hand side is what we call a bubble diagram that talks about the functionality and the, the workflow and the adjacencies between spaces. And this was all worked out by meeting uh, at least twice with the users to collect information and to uh, refine the requirements. And the purpose of 
this kind of information is to set the design team, the design architects up for success. This, this is that, that description of, of, of what programming means. It's defining the problem. Next slide, please. Phase one, so on slide nine, talks about the renovation of Memorial. I said it was the predicate project that needed to happen uh, in order to set up Heldenfels and Harpen renovations. Uh, you can see from the yellow arrow on that aerial, uh, a lot of people are moving to different places on the campus into Memorial, and that, uh, that frees up or, or unlocks the ability of the rest of the, of the 2014 bond to occur. Next slide on page 10. This is, a, again, a glimpse inside the Memorial program requirements, talking about roughly 29,000 square feet. Uh, listing of the spaces and the occupants on the left-hand side of the page and the functional relationships on the right-hand side. Next slide. Where the bubble diagrams represent horizontal relationships, we also diagram the vertical relationships in what we call a stacking diagram. And this is as if you took a knife through the building and looked at which activities would be located on one floor and which activities would be located on the floor above. Uh, in this illustration, the darker color represent the various uh, departmental spaces associated with administration and the lighter color gray um, are the common spaces. Next slide. So with administration moving to Memorial, we can move on to slide 12 and talk about the next phase. Uh, and uh, Heldenfels is now vacant because administration has moved out. Uh, admissions testing can move into Heldenfels, moving across the street from the multi-service center. Uh, enrollment moves down from Harbin, uh, and the, it, those provide the basis for all of the, the one-stop activities in Heldenfels. Next slide. Same, same groups inside the program, talking about the spaces on the left, roughly 18,000 square feet of renovation again. Here's this welcome center and one stop and, and back of the house spaces to support that. You can see the bubble diagram gets equally complex here because while it's a, uh, a relatively simple activity to produce a one stop center, pulling it off and getting it right means a lot of working parts have to come together. And this was all worked out again with the, with the staff and the departmental uh, team. Next slide. Also a part of phase two is the renovation of the White Library, shown on slide 14. And we can move directly on to slide 15 as well to look inside that program. And while the library is 97,000 square feet, there was money allocated in the bond to renovate about four-fifths of it. And that's because the fourth floor had recently been renovated in a previous project. Uh, the green represents the uh, kind of the library functions and the, uh, the, the graves are the, are the common spaces. Next slide. This shows the stacking diagram for the library. Again, green being the library type spaces and the grays being the, the more common spaces. Next slide, moving on to slide 17, it's phase three. This is the renovation of uh, Harvin and also some renovations of the multi-service center across the street. But this is bringing the, the student center, again, as I like to say, into the 21st century. I need to come up with a new term because we're already one-fifth of the way into our century. But it is a, an opportunity to expand student services and to refresh this building. Uh, we are also recommending that the boardroom, uh, although it's, it's good to have in a student center because it connects the board with the students, we think that the, the square footage of the real estate is, is preciously needed for student activities, and we hope the board will move to another location. Next slide on page 18. A student center done correctly is one of the most complex buildings on 
on a college campus, and you can see the, the, the roughly 75,000 square feet of space you know, allocated on the left-hand side, and the bubble diagram of how the pieces fit together, everything from the uh, journalism and the foghorn, the multi-purpose space, to counseling, to disability, to student life. There are just so many um, pieces that come together. Slide 19. Uh, is a stacking diagram through the two-story um, student center. And the spaces that are more common and active are ground floor spaces. The spaces that are above are more student services. I won't call them back of the house, but they are um, more individual in nature. Slide 20, also included in the 2014 bond was a project to uh, work on the campus edge uh, all the way around to kind of identify Del Mar as a place. There's nothing wrong with the campus edge. We've gone to the next page. Um, but it's, it's somewhat average or bland. And so the board at that time thought that, that it would be valuable to, to kind of spruce up the first impression that people get when they drive toward the campus. Next slide, 22. Uh, not nearly as exciting, but absolutely necessary. The project also called for roof replacements for several buildings. Next slide, 23. Uh, and roof replacements on West Campus. Next slide, 24. Uh, West Campus also gets some renovation of the general purpose building and some landscaping uh, and hardscaping work. Next slide, 25. Because this is a, uh, a domino type of series of projects, uh, the three phases are outlined as three discrete parts on a schedule, starting with phase one, uh, which renovates as this, you know, this, the fine arts is, is being renovated, uh, memorial is renovated into executive space, uh, and that will occur as soon as the architecture hired this fall and design can begin. As that is proceeding, it will fast track with phase two, which is the renovation of uh, Helenfels and the White Library. And then phase three is the next band, um, renovation of the multi-purpose center, uh, renovating Harbin uh, into the new or the re envisioned student center. The four boxes at the bottom, demolishing Heritage Hall, and renovate the general purpose building on West Campus, the uh, campus edge, roof replacements, and the paving. So those can occur or can have an early start. Next Doug, slide. Doug, before you go on, I want to stop. Just stop and see if uh, I have a, I have a question. I don't know if you know the regions have questions about the information you've presented. But back on um, the Phase three, renovate Harvin MSC. Well, actually, it doesn't matter where it is, but the, uh, the question I have is about financial aid and counseling uh, versus advising. So I, I realize that, that not all our counselors are not necessarily advisors, but financial aid specifically, why that is not in the enrollment center uh, at Heldenfels versus uh, keeping it at Harvin. Uh, financial aid is going to Harvin. Um, enrollment. Melvin uh, Fells will contain financial aid and enrollment. Yeah, Melvin Fells. I'm sorry, I misspoke. The one stop center will contain financial aid and enrollment. The student pieces? The administrative back cost of Melvin Fells is daily to day in Harvin. Yes. Because Melvin Fells is a building that's a little bit tight in terms of the amount of square foot available for what we want to do. We chose to recommend keeping some of the administrative space in Harvin uh, because there literally just wasn't enough space to move everything into Helen If I may, if I may add, Doug, um, there's so you're, you're you're bifurcating the office to some degree. You're getting so the Helen Fells uh, building is predominantly is based on that first time to Del Mar College experience, that, that intake, if you will. 
um, operations. And so there'll be some operating there. And then, as you know, once the students are here and they're operating and so forth, that, they'll, that, that the, the primary, um, the majority of the office uh, and the operations can remain uh, essentially where it is uh, here at the campus. So it's, it's really putting out and, and triaging those front end uh, services for the first time, first, to Del first time to Del Mar College students. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Are there questions from other regions at this point? I have a question for something I didn't see. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, we, we discussed building envelopes a couple of years ago, and they were doing a study about the building envelopes to see what was going to be paid for with the 2014 bond. I don't see that in here. Am I just missing that? This is John Strybos. Um, with Carly was yeah. evaluating that. The, the roofs are part of the building envelope, and we do have roof replacement in that. And we continue to do some updated studies about the building envelopes on several of the buildings. Okay, so that's continuing ongoing? Yes, yeah, so the, the studies are so we can identify the priorities, and then I, we can work with the president and bring back to the Board of Regents about a specific plan and how to fund it. Very good. Thank you. Yes, sir. I, I've got an additional comment about the budget too, Mr. Bennett, so stand by, but I don't want to interrupt too much more with, uh, with Doug's presentation. I'll, I'll add, add that at the end. Okay, 27 is my last slide, which is the budget slide. Um, Continue, Doug. Next, next slide. There was 40, 40 one more, 27. Next slide. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, next slide. One more. There we go. Uh, it's $42 million um, out in 2014 for the projects that we've described and are listed on this page. Um, at the time the, the, that bond program was put together, it did not have the benefit of all the detailed programming work and staff involvement. So the allocation of that $42 million was uh, estimated. Now that we know much more about the need each one of the projects, uh, we are hoping that the board will allow some movement of monies uh, between different projects. For example, the $6.6 .6 million for Campus Edge, about halfway down the table, uh, may be more than is actually needed. Some of those dollars could be reallocated to one of the other building projects. As, and as we move through design, or as the projects move through design, you'll begin to understand that need more clearly. Uh, but I'm just foreshadowing a, an item that may come to the board in a future meeting. Keeping the $42 million bond allocation, um, keeping that bucket as is, but just moving monies between projects within, now that we've more clearly identified the needs. And that is all my information, and be happy to take any more questions. Madam Chair, may I? Yes. Doug, Doug, this is Mark. And you, you hit the nail right on the head and, and uh, pointed out uh, the, the um, lack of balance, if you will, with certain, certain projects listed here. And so we are looking uh, for the opportunity to come back to you all, Regents. Uh, to to have uh, once we get the uh, design elements uh, figured into uh, figured out for these for these projects uh, to find uh, the best um, balance if you will to the projects um, I think the campus edge is unbalanced I think is an understatement um, and and there are other more critical uh, as, as important as the East Campus Edge and our exterior is there are other more more critical areas um, that would serve students um, and people uh, as, uh, through through redesign and and, and uh, renovation than uh, that need uh, I, I would say at least a portion of those of those funds and so we will seek that equilibrium throughout these throughout these projects and and, and bring back our recommendations um, as soon as we uh, possibly can. Thank you, Dr. Escamilla. Are there any questions or comments from members of the board? Hearing none, thank you both very much for this work. It's very informative. We appreciate it.
and look forward to our, our future updates and decisions. They'll be coming soon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Let me go back to my agenda. All right, so that concludes our staff reports. Uh, we'll now move on to pending items. Uh, you will see on the presentation in front of you several things that we have today uh, and, and updates that are coming uh, in our August meeting. We will have some revisions to this based on our discussions today, the policy workshop, for example, in September and others. So um, you see that we've got in August our interim audit report to the board, uh, a legislative update, um, and including that is that uh, interim status of the grant management audit and our annual review of tax abatement, etc. So if there's any questions on that, please let me know. Uh, if not, we will move on to our consent agenda. Items for our consent agenda include approval of minutes from uh, May 28th, 29th board retreat and our June 9th board meeting and the acceptance of the investments for June of 2020. Are there any regions that would like any items pulled for separate consideration? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda items as presented? I moved. Thank you, Ms. Averett. Is there a second? I'll second. I'll by second. Second by Ms. Hutchison. Uh, I'm going to do a roll call vote for each of these. So please be prepared to say yay or nay, yes or no, whatever, however you'd like to answer. Uh, Regent Averett. Yes. Dr. Sherwood. Yes. Regent Bennett. Yes. Regent Hutchison. Yes. yes. Regent Hutchison votes yes, yes. thank you. Regent Estrada? Thank you. And Regent Salinas? Regent Salinas? Regent Salinas, if you'll raise your hand, wave at us as a yes. Very good, okay. And then Carol Scott votes yes. So all those items pass unanimously. So moving on to our regular agenda, we have a uh, discussion and possible action regarding the order of the 2020 Regent General Elections and candidate information. Uh, Ms. McDonald and Ms. Jessica Alanis will be presenting that information. Ms. McDonald? Yes, thank you. Um, we have two items. The first one item is for action, and that will be the order calling the 2020 Del Mar College District Board of Regents General Election. So we will take care of that uh, action first. And actually, uh, Mr. Rivera, our general counsel, we are required to read the order. So he will be reading that order, then you can take action. And the second part is, is not for action, but it's for informational purposes for the candidates. And Ms. Alanis, who serves as our election authority, will be presenting that. So Mr. Rivera. Thank you. Regent Scott, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Regents, uh, before you is the order calling the 2020 Del Mar College District Board of Regents general election for your consideration. And it reads as follows. On this blank day of July 2020, the Board of Regents of the Del Mar College District convened in a regular meeting via video and or teleconference at the Eisenhower Boardroom, Harvin Center, Del Mar College, East Campus, 101 Baldwin Boulevard, Corpus Christi, Texas. After due notice to all members of the board and the general public, the following members were present and we will indicate, you, you've got the entire roster there, but we'll indicate which of you are actually present, as well as which following members were absent. Uh, a quorum being present, the following business, among other business, was transacted. Uh, blank, be, meaning uh, whichever one of you moves for this for consideration, introduce for consideration and order and move that it be made, adopted and entered by the board. The motion was seconded by blank. The order was read in full, discussed and then made, adopted and entered by the following vote, and there's a space to indicate the record vote. The board chair announced that the order had been duly made, adopted, and entered as follows. Number one, paragraph one. A general election be held in said Del Mar College District on November 3rd, 2020. Its date being the first Tuesday. Hang on a second. Regent Estrada, could you mute? Thank you. 
convened the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November 2020 for the purpose of electing three members to the Board of Regents of the Del Mar College District. One member to hold a single member district position and two members to hold an at-large position. The single member district candidate receiving a plurality of the votes cast by electors residing in single member district four shall be elected to hold the position of board member from such single member district. The two at-large candidates receiving the largest number of votes cast by electors residing in the entire district shall be elected to the two at-large positions currently held by the board members whose term expires in November 2020. Paragraph two, Ms. Jessica A. Alanis, whose office is situated at the Heldenfels Administration Building, Delmar College East Campus, 101 Baldwin Boulevard, Corpus Christi, Texas, is hereby appointed election manager for the district election. And she is hereby authorized and directed to make all necessary arrangements for the holding of said election jointly with Nueces County and to serve as representative to oversee and coordinate with the Nueces County election officer in conducting the election in accord with and subject to the laws of the state. Ms. Alanis and the Nueces County election officer are appointed to hold such joint election in accord with the laws of this state. Paragraph three, in order to have his or her name appear on the official ballot, each candidate shall no later than 5 p.m. August 17th, 2020, file his or her written sworn application as a candidate for such office with Jessica A. Alanis at her office in room 105A of the Fred Heldenfels Jr. Administration Building, East Campus, Delmar College, 101 Baldwin Boulevard, Corpus Christi, Texas. Paragraph four, the order in which the names of the candidates shall appear in the ballot shall be determined by drawing lots, which drawing shall be held in the Eisensee Boardroom, East Campus, Delmar College, 101 Baldwin Boulevard, at 12 p.m. Monday, August 24, 2020. Each candidate may appear in person or by his or her duly authorized representative at said time and place for the purpose of drawing lots to determine such order. And if any candidate fails to appear in person or by his representative, a disinterested person shall then be appointed to draw for him, her, in his or her place instead. Paragraph five, no party designation shall appear on the official ballot of said election and all candidates for each office of region shall be listed in one column. Paragraph six, the election precincts and voting places for this election are hereby designated by the Nueces County election officer, Kara Sands. Paragraph seven, the presiding election judges and alternate presiding judges for the respective election precincts will be designated by the Nueces County clerk's office and hereby appointed and confirmed to hold such election at said polling places. The maximum number of clerks that each presiding judge may appoint for each election is two, unless the county election officer approves a larger number with respect to any specific precinct. Paragraph eight, voting machines shall be used for the conduct of said election on election day and the poll shall be open on November 3rd, 2020 from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Paragraph nine, early voting by personal appearance shall be conducted during the following days and times, including but not limited to October 19th through October 30th, 2020, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. The county election officer, Kara Sands, is hereby designating the early voting clerk. Deputy early voting clerks for the branch locations for early voting by personal appearance shall be appointed by the county election officer. Paragraph 10, temporary branch early voting substation locations and times are hereby designated by the Nueces County Clerk's Office. Paragraph 11, early voting by mail shall be conducted by paper ballot. The early voting clerks mailing address to which ballot applications and ballots voted by mail may be sent is Kara Sands, Nueces County Clerk, Attention Elections Division, P.O. Box 2627, Corpus Christi, Texas 78403-2627. Applications for ballots by mail must be received no later than the close of business on October 16, 2020. Paragraph 12. A central counting station will be used to process the results of the early voting ballots. The county election officer shall appoint the county station manager and tabulation supervisor of said central counting station. Paragraph 13, notice of said election shall be given as required by law. Final page, Madam Chair, is, uh, uh, indicates that uh, the board has adopted this and approved it on the date specified above, and then it's got the signatures for yourself and Dr. Sherwood as secretary. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rivera. Are there any questions about this order? Is there a motion to approve this election order? I would so move. Thank you very Second. much. Ms. Hutchison, Dr. Sherwood seconds that motion. Uh, any other discussion? Uh, I'm going to do the round robin again. Uh, Mr. Salinas, vote yes or no? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Estrada, are you on the phone? Yes, I am. Would you vote yes or no? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Thank you. Regent Hutchison? Yes. Regent Bennett? Yes. Dr. Sherwood? 
Yes. Regent Averett? Yes. Mrs. Regent Scott, I vote aye. Uh, so that, pa that motion passes unanimously. Thank you all very much. Ms. Alanis, would you like to review the uh, information you prepared for candidates? Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. Um, so the filing period for the 2020 general election for the Board of Regents begins on um, Saturday, July 18th. The college has set office hours in order to allow interested applicants to submit or pick up packets um, that are interested in filing for place on the ballot. Office hours will begin July 20th through August 12th on Mondays and Wednesdays only from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And on the filing deadline on August 17th from 7.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, we have also done something a little bit different this year in making the packet available and accessible to interested parties online. And you can also send an email to my email address that's on the notice to request one be mailed to you by U.S. mail. So we have tried to be a little bit more accessible in the light of the current pandemic situation. And any of those individuals that have questions, there's um, the comprehensive information within the packet and instructions of everything that um, a person or an individual needs to do in order to file for place on the ballot. So we have posted this notice online and it is also in the packet as well for review. So if there are any questions, um, this is the information for the filing period for the uh, beginning date of July 20th to August 17th. Thank you very much, Ms. Alanis. So are there any Further questions for Ms. Alanis or Ms. McDonald? Thank you all. We will Thank you. Uh, move on to uh, item number four on our regular agenda, which is discussion and possible action regarding the college's quarterly investment report. Uh, Mr. Garcia will introduce uh, David McElwain with Patterson Associates, who will give us our presentation. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So the federal government in recent months have introduced fis fiscal and monetary policy to provide emergency support in response to the COVID-19 crisis. These actions in part ha are having an impact uh, to the U.S. economy. Today we have David Malkway from uh, Patterson and Associates who, uh, in the interest of time, will briefly discuss the trending financial and geopolitical activities that are impacting the college's investment uh, yields. Mr. McAway, you will. Mr. McAway, I think you may have your mic off. I'm sorry, Mr. Can everybody McAway. hear me through okay. the phone? There we go. Yes. Okay. Well, thank everybody for having me here today. We're just gonna briefly uh, go through the quarterly report. Um, obviously, with all the volatility um, in uh, the economy, with having to go to shelter in place, uh, the Federal Reserve came out with two emergency rate cuts. Um, they cut 50 basis points on March the 5th, and then they cut again on March 15th by another 100 basis points. Um, you can forward to the next slide and we'll look in detail at some of the summary. So obviously we, we shut everything down, then we went to a reopen phase. Um, and as we started to reopen, obviously the numbers uh, started again to spike as far as cases. And so we're, we've been kind of in this tug of war here. Um, it's kind of a push pull. You're you know, darned if you do, you're darned if you don't. Um, a lot of people need to get back to work, um, but uh, obviously safety is kind of paramount um, in the government's eyes at the moment. You can go, uh, just if you look at the graphs, you can see the dramatic changes in the non-farm payrolls there to the right. Obviously there was a massive spike. We went from a decade low unemployment rate of around you know 3%. Uh, in January, and then all of a sudden, when we went to full-blown shutdown, we saw the unemployment rate spike down to about 15%. And um, we 
since reopening, about uh, 4.8 million jobs got rehired. So we saw the unemployment rate temporarily rise back up to 11%. But obviously, we're still kind of in limbo here. Um, it's probably going to take at least another quarter or two before we can figure out what's normal. Uh, but I do think we'll see uh, the economy start to gradually improve. And obviously, uh, the bar has been set very low. So when we do get to the point where people get back to work, we're going to start to get some statistically improved data, which will lend itself um, to a, the confidence. You can go to the next slide. Again, uh, we've had a lot of efforts from um, the FOMC. The Federal Reserve has thrown a lot of different uh, money uh, at, you know, at the economy. Um, anything from, you know, uh, relief checks to all sorts of funding for commercial paper programs at the height of the panic. We were seeing a who's who list of people coming out and just raising cash due to the uncertainty. You saw, you know, Coca-Cola, Nike, Exxon, Disney, um, a major pharmaceutical companies. All these guys were coming out and paying rates of up to two. And in some cases, we were able to get, you know, uh, Royal Dutch Shell commercial paper at a 3% high yield during the height of the panic. Um, you know, right now, uh, the Fed is down between zero and a quarter point on the Fed funds rate, they're probably just gonna remain here indefinitely until we see some meaningful pickup in the economy, which we really don't foresee that being at least another nine to 12 months before we see some uh, traction there. If you go to the next slide. Again, um, it's just kind of, we're looking at a yield curve here uh, that is extremely compressed. We're at record low interest rates. Um, this is just taking a snapshot from the end of May. Right now, uh, rates are even lower than they were then. Uh, a one-year treasury yield is 14 basis points, two years at 15 basis points, and a three-year treasury yield is a whopping 0.17% right now. So it's it's really um, it's really important to be able to have flexibility when looking for investments. Um, in fact, uh, we see the 30-year Treasury yield is at a 131. So you know that's that's also an all-time low. Mortgage rates are about three percent for 30-year mortgages. Uh, if you go to the next slide, we'll look specifically at the uh, at the colleges funds. Um, at the end of uh, May, you had about 36.5% of the total funds were in the local maintenance or the pooled funds. I um, heard y'all talking earlier about the plant funds, kind of the reserve fund. There's about 7% there. And then you've got about 46% uh, between the 2018A and B construction funds with um, you've got a little tax uh, INS and revenue INS that uh, composes the other 10% of the pie. Go to the next slide, please. And obviously, uh, as interest rates, um, this, this little graph here, obviously we highlight May and the far left column and compared it to the previous quarter just to the right, February of 2020. Um, you see we're looking specifically at the pooled fund group, the local maintenance funds, excluding those construction funds. You see the market value there. Um, it was a, uh, looks like a spin down of a little over 11 million, um, roughly net net. Uh, the weighted average maturity is roughly the same quarter over quarter. Uh, the yield obviously is a function of uh, everything shrinking down dramatically, although Portfolio for the college is appreciably above a six mark, you know, six month bill at the end of May was yielding a 0.22, um, and the college had a yield of a 129. Um, 
again, if you compare that to where it was a year ago, you had a six month T-bill yield of a 246 all the way over at the far right. And the portfolio yield for the uh, college was uh, at a 254 then. So, you know, all things relative, um, the college has a much wider spread than the treasury curve. It's going to come down because as some of our better investments mature, Obviously, we've got to reinvest at the prevailing lower rates that are available. If you go to the next slide, just again, representing, um, I guess, categorically, the what the pooled funds kind of look like. Uh, if you look at the pie chart to the right, uh, there was about almost 9% of the portfolio was in call up, agency callables. And uh, as interest rates spiked down, we got called out of all those agency notes. And then you'll see a green slice of the pie and on the left. We really transitioned over to municipal bonds because there was way more value in municipal bonds than we've seen in years. Um, we were seeing spreads over callable agencies and any time that relationship comes into play, we're gonna go wherever the best, you know, wherever we can get the best bang for the buck you know, without sacrificing credit quality and staying within the parameters of the investment policy. So I think that was kind of the meaningful um, shift there. We kind of maximized commercial paper uh, in the pool fund group. And um, at the height of the crisis in March, one of our crown jewel investments was we bought some state of Texas tax anticipation notes, which unfortunately mature next month. But there was such a panic and everything was being sold along with stocks. The um, tax exempt bond funds were being sold along with everything else. And the portfolio managers were looking, you know, to raise cash hand over fist. And we were able to buy some of that paper at a, um, like a 272 yield. And that yield on that paper today is like a 0.15. So, Everything's calmed down and, and rates again are extremely compressed. If you'll go to the next slide, if anybody has any questions, just chime in. Um, now we're taking a snapshot of the bond funds, the construction funds, cumulatively, in, uh, in cumulatively uh, combining 2018 A and B. You see in May, uh, the market value there was a little over 89 million. In February, uh, that market value was 102 million. That was a function of roughly 13 million uh, in construction funds uh, being spent out. Um, you see the weighted average maturities come down. Um, that's just a function, obviously, um, we've kind of taken a little bit more of a barbell approach, but we've, um, we've kind of really leaned on buying opportunities on the shorter end of the curve. Um, not really wanting to go too terribly heavy on these lower yields. We don't, we don't want to extend duration too far out. And uh, that's the approach we'll kind of stick with um, for the foreseeable future. Again, you just see the marked differences uh, in the portfolio yield. Obviously, the portfolio yield is a lot higher than the benchmark um, treasury yield. Um, but again, it's going to continue to contract down, I would anticipate by the end of next quarter. You'll see the uh, college yield, the college may have a yield in the low 1% range, and by low one, maybe, you know, somewhere between a one to a 110. And that benchmark T-bill now is down to, gosh, six month T-bills at a 0.15. So go to the next slide, and we'll see it kind of represented graphically. Um, Again, you'll see uh, a much larger piece of the pie now is in municipal bonds, in the bond funds. And again, it's, as we discussed previously, there's been a lot more value uh, in municipal bonds than there has been historically. So we've been aggressively looking for those opportunities and uh, the municipal bond funds, the municipal bonds themselves, typically, um, you know, the good thing about them is when we buy them, we're locked in unlike a callable agency note, if rates are going down on us, we're being called out of coupons that are higher because the issuers, you know, calling them in and reissuing at lower coupons. So 
you see the um, the overall portfolio there is about 40% in liquid investment pools, 23.5% in commercial paper. Um, there's a little bit in uh, collateralized CDs at a 170 yield. And uh, again, our, our yields are going to look really great until, you know, they obviously, uh, things start to mature out. But the muni bonds are going to be um, kind of the bright spot of the portfolio for the foreseeable future. Do you want to go to the next slide? And you can slide on to the next slide. I think uh, there another slide past that. Nope, that's the end of the presentation. We do have addition, the backup okay. information in our board packets. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot more detail. You, you'll you'll kind of see if you look at uh, if, if you take the time to look through the individual securities in the portfolio. The one thing that'll probably jump out to you is at you know towards the end of March and in early part of May, you'll see you know how we were able to to buy a lot of investments in the uh, in that low one percent range up to a high of like a two seventy two for the state of Texas TANS. And that was just a very short window of time that we had to seize those opportunities. And luckily you had the liquidity to act on them and uh, lock some of those great yields in while they were there. Yeah, so Mr. Um, Mack, thank you very much for that information. Um, sure. you know, I, I think the, there's an upside and a downside to this uh, low interest rate environment. Uh, the the upside is that you know we're able to capture some very low uh, rates uh, when we issued our bonds. Uh, the downside is that on our investments uh, is not uh, is not getting the best yields uh, that we've seen in the past. Uh, but it almost sounds like you know if, if the economy uh, uh, it, it turns back on, uh, then uh, this this investment strategy that Mr. Uh, David McAvoy has discussed, we can be able to to capture some of those bigger yields as, as it starts to ramp up. So thank you very much, sir. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Any questions, just uh, fire away. Does the board have any questions? Is there a motion to adopt the college's quarterly investment report? So moved. Thank you, Ms. Averett. Mr. Bennett, will you second? Second. Thank you very much. Um, all those in favor, raise your hand. Mr. Salinas, are you in favor? Yes, thank you. Uh, Regent Estrada, are you in favor? Say yes or no. Yes. Thank you very much. I vote in favor. That motion passes unanimously. We will now move on, continuing with a couple of items regarding investments to our uh, annual resolution adopting our investment policy and investment strategy. Mr. Garcia? Yes, so uh, thank you, Madam Chair. In accordance with board policy B4.6.25, there's an annual review of the investment policy and strategies followed by recommended changes, if any, for the coming year. Today, we have once again, David Malkaway from uh, Patterson and Associates who will present the results of the annual review of the investment policy. Yes, thanks again, Raul. Um, we are recommending um, due to the need to be more flexible and to be able to, again, kind of find the little pockets of value that we can in such a compressed environment. We're recommending uh, to all of our clientele to extend the maximum maturity of commercial paper from 180 days to 270 days, which is what is allowable by the Public Funds Investment Act. Um, we're going to maintain uh, the, the uh, same 25% max in the portfolio at the time of purchase, so we're not altering how much commercial paper we want to own. We just want to be able to maybe extend out um, past six months and where there's an opportunity to get a higher yield between seven, eight, or nine months. Um, you know, we can, you know, in some cases, uh, somebody may only be offering 35, 0.35 for six months we may be able to get a 0 0.50 to extend out for three more months. So we think that that's the smart thing to be doing right now. Um, it doesn't really affect the weighted average maturity. And oftentimes we use commercial paper 
to help us balance out our longer term coupon payments to keep the weighted average maturity down. The other recommendation is uh, there, there previously there was a maximum of 20% on municipal bonds in the portfolio. And uh, we really, I can't recall uh, owning a municipal bond in the past uh, year and a half since I've been at the firm. But uh, when the time came, you know, we got up to that 20% max quickly. And, um, you know, we're still seeing opportunities that we can't take advantage of and, until we wait for a maturity. So we're recommending taking the maximum in municipal bonds from 20 to 30% because we, there are other opportunities that are going to give uh, the college better yields. And um, we want to be able to take advantage of them when we come across them. And so um, that's, that's the proposed changes. Thank you for that explanation. Regents, you have the actual policy document with the track changes in it, uh, as well as a resolution that I'm going to ask Mr. Uh, Rivera to read in just a moment that was the formal resolution that we must adopt. But I'm looking to see if there's any questions or comments on this policy revision. Not seeing any. Mr. Rivera, can you read the resolution, please? Regent Scott, I don't think it's necessary to read this one if it saves time and helps. Perfect. Regents, you have a copy of the resolution in front of you. Yeah. Uh, is there a motion to approve the resolution uh, which documents the changes as suggested? Mr. Salinas, do you make it? Sorry, I saw Mr. Salinas with his uh, mic on. Mr. Salinas, do you make the motion? Yes. Thank you. Dr. I Sherwood. I second that motion. Okay. I'm going to let you, Dr. Mr. Salinas, make the motion. Dr. Sherwood, second. All those in okay. favor, raise your hand so that I can see it. Thank you. Any opposed, raise your hand. Regent Estrada, do you vote yes or no? Yes. All right. The regents have all voted unanimously to adopt that policy as presented. Thank you very much. And then finally, uh, Mr. Garcia, a adoption of our annual broker-dealer list. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. In accordance with Public Investment Act, Section 2256.025, Del Mar College is required to review, revise, and or adopt a list of qualified broker-dealers authorized to engage in investment activities for the college on an annual basis. Today we have David Mockaway from Patterson and Associates who will present the results of the annual review of the qualified broker dealers authorized list to uh, engage uh, investment activities for the college on an annual uh, basis followed by a recommendation of changes if any for the coming year. Okay great thank you. Could you just forward to that next slide quickly and Are y'all uh, are you able to hear? Y'all able to forward to the page 170, the next page? I'm just gonna tell you what the changes were. Yes, you had it up on the screen. It's there. Oh, okay. Is it just down below? Okay. The only changes to the broker dealer list uh, there were two new additions. Um, I believe it was Robert uh, Baird, and we also added UBS Financial. The other three changes were just name changes. There were mergers. Um, so first, what was formerly First Tennessee was FTN Financial, became FHN Financial, and uh, the um, uh, Siebert Williams Shank was a merger with Williams Company, and the other was, um, I believe it was, yeah, Piper Sandler used to be Piper Jeffrey. So that was really it, the two new additions. Uh, three of them were just simply name changes. Everything else remained the same. The last two broker dealers were added um, due to some of their strengths in underwriting uh, municipal bonds. And um, again, that gives us a total of 18 broker dealers um, where we can have access to the best inventory in our opinion and to be able to find the best deals for you guys. So that's, um, those were the changes that were made there. Any questions regarding that? 
All right. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution authorizing our broker, our new broker dealer list? Mr. Bennett makes that mm -hmm. motion. Ms. Not Hutch with second. Thank you, Ms. Hutchison. Seconds that motion. Uh, all those in favor, Regents, please raise your hand so that I can see it. Any opposed? Raise your hand. Regent Estrada, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Thank you very much. That motion passes unanimously. Okay, Regents, we okay, are Okay, well, thank you all for your time. Thank you, thank you. all. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Regents, we're going to take a short break before we go into closed session so that we can clear the virtual room. Uh, and we're going to ask if you will please l allow me to share my screen. I'm going to do a virtual countdown. Um, so the organizer is going to make me a presenter. So we'll have about a 10-minute break uh, so that we can come back refreshed. From our recess at uh, 426, uh, Regents I failed to uh, let Mr. Garcia do his final agenda item, number seven, which is the college's quarterly financial report. So if um, Mr. Garcia will do that, then we will go back to, uh, well, then we'll break for closed session after that. Mr. Garcia? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I have for you, uh, today the third quarter financial statements um, that will be on the next slide I believe yes thank you I have for you today the third quarter uh, financial statements that includes the income statement for the nine months ended May 2020 and the balance sheet as of May 31st of 2020 I will go over several data points on the reports that point to the college's sound financial condition to whether the current crisis Let's start with the revenues. The property tax revenue collection rate of 98% through the end of May is trending in accordance with the planned budget. The college believes the remaining $1 million will be collected by the end of the fiscal year. The tuition and fees revenue collections rate of 85% through the end of May is trending within reason uh, to the planned budget. The college once again believes that the remaining $3.9 million will be collected by the end of fiscal year based on the latest student enrollment for summer two. The base appropriations revenue collection rate of 72% is trend trending in accordance with the planned budget. Based on the governor's recent, rec uh, recent commitment not to reduce this year's appropriation, the college believes the remaining 4.7 million will be collected by the end of this, this fiscal year. Miscellaneous revenue is trending above the planned budget due in part by investment yields that were captured months ago when interest rates were great and phenomenal. The college expects a leveling of the investment yields due in part to reduce yields that started with the uh, crisis uh, uh, back in March. The next category is operating expenses. Today's uh, salary and benefit expense of 56.2 million is trending within the planned budget of 79.3 million. Non-salary expenses of 16.4 million is trending slightly above the planned budget and prior year's expenses valued at 15.3 million. That's at the bottom. Uh, the increase is driven in part uh, by COVID-19 related health and safety supplies and equipment. That's about $356,000. And uh, insurance costs uh, that increased uh, about uh, $828,000. The college will seek reimbursements from the CARES Act funding and the FEMA grant for the COVID-19 related expenses. So pivoting on to the balance sheet on the next slide. Uh, I'm sorry, yes, there you go, balance sheet, thank you. Okay, uh, I would like to point out one of the college's financial strengths as noted by Fitch, Standard & Poor, and Moody's bond rating agencies is the college's financial liquidity. The college's unrestricted cash and investment as of, of the end of May is valued at $64.3 million. With this level of liquidity, the college is well positioned to fund the college's uh, reported obligations that includes the accounts payable, the annual revenue 
bonded debt service payment, and the college's statutory required annual pension and OPEP obligations, and, uh, and the revenue bond annual debt service payment. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Mr. President, this concludes my presentation on the quarterly financial statements. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for um, Mr. Garcia? Not seeing in the, any. Is there a motion to accept the college's quarterly financial report? Mr. Bennett makes a motion. Second. Dr. Sherwood seconds that motion. Uh, all those in favor, raise your right, raise a hand if you're in favor of that adoption. Same sign if you're opposed. Ms. Estrada? Yes. Thank you very much. That motion carries unanimously. Now the board will go into closed session uh, pursuant to Texas Government Code 551.087 regarding commercial or financial information that the government body has received from a business prospect that the government body seeks to have locate, stay, or expand in or near the territory of the governmental body and with which the governmental body is conducting economic development negotiations or two, the deliberation of an offer of financial or other incentive to a business prospect described by one with possible discussion and action open session. Also, Texas Government Code 551.071 regarding pending or contemplated litigation or a settlement offer with possible discussion and action open session and the seeking of legal advice from counsel on pending litigation, legal or contemplated matters or claims with possible discussion and action in open session. And under Texas Government Code 551.074A1 regarding the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment duties, discipline or dismissal of a public officer employee including the annual evaluation of the college president with possible discussion and action in open session. The time is 4.32 p.m. come back from closed session at 5.40 p.m. There is no action coming out of closed session today. Uh, next item on our agenda is calendaring. We have asked uh, Delia Pettis to send out a note to all of the regents with the dates and times for our upcoming meetings in August, um, as, as well as a reminder that our September meeting, we will start early with a workshop on, uh, on the policy discussions. Um, are there any other calendar items, Dr. Eskimi, that we need just, to... Just at the workshop, maybe a little bit broader. There are two topics. There's the KPIs. Unless we can work it into a, a, a staff report, depending on the weight of the, of the agenda, we may squeeze two into a, the, to the workshop. It just depends. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll be as efficient as we possibly can. So just gotcha. keep that in mind. Okay. Uh, with no other business coming before the board, uh, we will adjourn our meeting at 5.41 p.m. Thank you all very much again for your attendance and for your uh, patience with our technology.